a very warm good evening to everyone and uh, i am very delighted and excited to for this a very special lecture on uh, agriculture food security and rural development amidst the covid-19 pandemic insights concerns and the way forward for indian villages uh, which is the for the speaker for this very special lecture is none other than professor r s deshpande uh, uh, who has also authored many books in fact one of the title of the book which uh, came uh, a decade ago uh, which came out from oxford uh, exactly the same title so we are revisiting the same amid the covid-19 pandemic and let me welcome all of you for this special lecture uh, uh, organized by center for work and welfare at impact and policy research institute we are very fortunate for having a very distinguished uh, discussants uh, uh, but most importantly the chair himself professor d n reddy uh, so without any further ado i would now like to invite uh, the chair for today's session professor d n reddy uh, who is such a famous professor that i don't think that uh, i i can introduce him a lot uh, but just briefly i would say that uh, professor d n reddy is, was a, a retired professor uh, uh, at at uh, uh, in economics and also dean of school of social sciences at university of hyderabad Uh, sir is having numerous position at many think tanks many research organization including uh, institute for human development where i also got uh, opportunity to work with sir indian society for labor economics indian economics uh, association and so on and so forth almost uh, past many four or five decades uh, sir's work is famous uh, all across india and over the world uh, so now i would invite uh, our chair for today uh, professor dn reddy to start with his opening remarks then we will go to our speaker Uh, thank you, Arjun, and uh, I have accepted to be here largely because uh, it's quite some time. I saw most of my friends who are sitting there, <laughs> and therefore it would be an occasion to meet. And then I am also seeing you with a little more of flush on your face. <laughs> I think uh, COVID doesn't seem to affect many of us. we are trying to face it with the same challenges that it should be uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, the theme as perhaps uh, uh, ram was trying to suggest is challenging because it's very vast in scope agriculture food security rural development and of course in the context of uh, what's going on in the name of the covid pandemic uh, it evokes a lot of let's say interest and the kind of let's say responses are also very widely varied in fact if you could sum up uh, there could be two extreme kind of responses for every one of these aspects either it is agriculture uh, food security or rural development there is one section which is uh, feeling hanky dory they think that uh, the only silver lining in the whole of this pandemic is agriculture uh, and therefore uh, they feel very comfortable i mean in this category of very positive way of looking at agriculture and of course not doing much is uh, the state or the government itself and of course when it turns to that of food security the same attitude exists because we know that when it comes to the question of uh, availability uh, we are supposed to be on the top of the world now with india being number one exporter of rice uh, already uh, there is huge stocks uh, available therefore uh, they feel that uh, particularly with the uh, rabi performance being uh, fairly good and the foresight for the kharif is much more uh, assuring and this uh, they feel that uh, we have no food security problem and this is one way of looking at it and same thing with that of rural development they say that somehow uh, the covid Uh, is uh, the one that is largely started and still continues to be an urban kind of a devastation and still they feel that uh, rural is somewhat let's say relatively 
not as badly affected as perhaps uh, urban earth. And therefore this one side, but uh, at the same time, come back to that of agriculture. If you look closely at uh, agriculture, uh, though I think this is exactly where historically we do talk in terms of agriculture doing much, much better. All these two decades under the uh, neoliberal regime, but I think the, the disconnect is with that of agriculturists, particularly small marginal farmers. They continue to be under distress. And therefore, many people do feel that uh, the version that agriculture is uh, doing robustly has to be taken very carefully by looking at those who are actually the producers, small marginal farmers. Same thing with that of food security. This is a historical kind of a dichotomy that I think now, interestingly, during this COVID, there are lots of writings remembering 1943 Bengal famine. It's not a lack of supply, but I think uh, the other side of demand that perhaps that caused so much of distress. And in spite of the fact that uh, there are interventions by the state and then programs for uh, making available, uh, foreseeing the kind of, let's say, distribution that takes place, uh, appear to be a large number who are not likely to access it continuously. Therefore, there are people who are expressing hunger. In fact, uh, uh, this is where I think one would notice, say there is something called as Janata Parliament, you must have noticed. There, I think they're all concerned about uh, the question of agriculture, and then what is being done to agriculture, particularly uh, to help, let's say, the farmers, and also those who are not able to access adequate food, food grains. It's one thing that, of course, there is an extension of free supply of food grains or through the till, let's say, November, but how far it's accessed and available adequately is a question. Same with that of rural development. In fact, last few days, particularly last one week, particularly today, I think you find that the reports which suggest that it's spreading to rural areas, COVID. The danger is that uh, the entire, what little that has happened to that of uh, health infrastructure, is largely concentrated in urban areas. And then rural is substantially bypassed. And therefore, there are serious concerns as to what will happen in this context. I mean, these are issues I don't want to anticipate. You have an excellent person who was uh, before all of you joined, who was trying to say it's a range of, let's say, experience from physics to computer science, and of course, um, ending up in, let's say, agriculture deeply. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Pandey is giving this lecture. And I'm also very happy that we have a very distinguished panel of eight speakers. Uh, the only problem for Arjun would be that, let's say, the time constraint. <laughs> and uh, I hope uh, we will have a, an interesting kind of a debate and discussion on this. Uh, with this, uh, I don't want to anticipate anything more. I said <laughs> much more than what I'm supposed to say. I request Arjun to take over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for, uh, um, for your opening remarks and uh, opening so many plethora of issues amidst this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I would now uh, uh, go to uh, uh, my alma mater, uh, Center for Study of Regional Development at School of so Social Sciences in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, uh, professor, Professor Erumalai Kannan from CSRD JNU to introduce the speaker for today. Um, Professor R.S. Desh Pandey. We can also have the poster on the screen. And uh, Professor Kannan, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Arjun. I'm extremely happy to share this virtual platform with the distinguished panelists here. I guess that the uh, organizer have, organizers have taken a risk of asking me to introduce someone whom I know both professionally and personally for quite a long time. 
in fact i can speak about professor rs deshpande in this entire evening session uh, professor deshpande is a critical thinker a free thinker a critical economist an institution builder an instrument in building human capital an uplifter of weak and socially disadvantaged people and so on in fact one can write essays on each of these themes um so uh, therefore i uh, no one requires introduction of professor deshpande uh, to this audience particularly i think nevertheless for the sake of formality let me say a few words about professor rs deshpande uh, professor rs deshpande is currently serving as an honorary fellow uh, as a honorary visiting professor at the institute for social and economic change isec bangalore professor deshpande served as a director of isec bangalore from 2008 to 2013 and uh, i in my assessment a glorious period of isec he had initiated a far reaching reforms at the institute covering the areas of teaching research capacity building infrastructure and resource mobilization in fact i have no hesitation to say in this public platform that i am one of the beneficiaries of his reforms that he introduced at at, at the institute professor deshpande holds phd in economics his research interests spans different areas in social sciences to mention a few agriculture development policy watershed development political economy of agrarian change agriculture trade rural policy and poverty economics of drought and irrigation economics of caste policy analysis applied econometrics and and so and so on professor deshpande provides a policy support to the government of karnataka and ministry of agriculture um, government of india in fact professor deshpande is a sole architect of the karnataka agriculture policy introduced in 2006 this was a kind of a kind of first a policy at the state level introduced in the state of karnataka and other states to emulate such a policy um to to see that the agriculture is given prime importance not only in the policy but also in the implementation side side professor deshpande was also a chairperson of mission on agriculture and rural development of karnataka he is served as a member of various policy bodies at the uh, state government of karnataka and also at the central government level um yeah so regarding his publications there are numerous publications which i can mention um uh, but to mention if you there are 17 books and he has authored about 110 research papers um to the one work which actually in fact helped me when i worked with the, worked with him at the institute was the agrarian change and the farmer suicide in fact i saw one of such one one of such works where he invoke that kind to uh, you know to to have a kind of conceptual framework to analyze the change agreed and change with with respect farmer suicide my association with him at the institute and work on a similar project helped to publish a paper in journal of agrarian change i think that's how the professor deshpande stands out as a as a mentor and a scholar to various the young professionalist professor deshpande um held visiting positions at various universities and institutions abroad to mention again a few university of ottawa canada saskatchewan institute of policy planning university of paris france lund university sweden and and, and so on professor deshpande was also awarded many you know the prizes and uh, and and the recipient of um many of the awards for his leadership award for his contributions and excellence in education and agriculture policy and and and, and so and so on so i can talk more about him but keeping time in mind um i think it's really we look forward to um given his experience 
and also contribution in the field of agriculture, food security, and rural development as a whole. So we look forward an illuminating um, lecture followed by a discussion on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kannan, for being so kind and coming here on, on short notice and uh, for so much uh, of a gracious introduction. I know the, 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 the version which we share was much longer. He also tried to be brief and concise without any, any, any uh, further delay of time. Now I would uh, request our uh, uh, chair to, for our speaker to, to start his speech. No, I request now uh, yes. Deshpande to start. Let's see. Okay. It, it's a, a wonderful evening. In fact, started with uh, Professor Nasimari. Please put that off for some time. Oh, oh, sure. uh, uh, with Professor Nasimari Dave, when he started speaking, I was a little bit jittery because uh, I think the issues that I'm going to cover more or less are of similar because usually the similar kind of thinkers uh, do think in a similar direction. Professor Reddy is, uh, uh, has not taught me, but if I say that, it will be erroneous. This, sometimes you read, you understand from the person and person's writing, and that's also a guru. So I read Professor Reddy, I heard him, and one thing which I could not copy him is the kind of posture the the delivery with almost steady words. I'm a little bit hurried person. Hurried so much that I hop and hop and jump, hop and jump. I could not uh, really get the style of Professor Eddy, but the issues that both of us have handled, in fact, agrarian distress, land, many of the issues which we have handled independently without asking each other, but almost similarly. So I was a little bit jittery and thanks that he, uh, he, he spoke for a few minutes and thanks Arjun for that. Possibly you would have restricted. <laughs> no, not that. Uh, second, Elumalai Kannan is, uh, uh, Professor Elumalai Kannan is one person whom I picked up. These things rarely happens in any of the institutions any university that a person walks in for a lower position interview and after the interview is asked, would you accept higher position? I remember one such instance, I don't know others, but it was about Ken Raj. Professor V. K. Rao offered him higher position, though he had appeared for a lower position. He went out of the uh, room called him back and said that we offer you a higher position. Exactly. And I, I don't stop at that. In fact, the selection committee for professorship also thought that why can't we take him up above? We could not. In any case, it was wonderful that Professor Kannan introduced and he did not, he uh, carefully avoided that indisciplined part of it. That I was never a student of agriculture economics in my lifetime. I never sat in the agriculture economics class. I don't have land. I have not plowed land, planted uh, crops, nothing of that sort. But then it's sheer out of my interest. I entered into it and I mastered it and happened to be in it. It was all my friends. I was thinking of extempore speaking, but then when uh, Professor Arjun was continuously talking to me and trying to put the thing, I thought, I, 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 I sensed the seriousness of the entire event. And when Professor Reddy was invited, this man invited that man, I, I really felt that yes, I must do a good job. And doing a good job, it, it takes a bit of time. So last three, four days working on it, and made my notes in the form of PPT presentation. Usually presentation is done when there is no power in the points that you make. 
but then i have injected power in the points that will be presented may i ask you to uh, share the presentation professor arjun sure sure we are doing like when professor reddy started talking about the subject it's quite an uh, intrigued it's quite entwined subject entwined in the sense that on one side we have a huge stocks we are happy we are absolutely happy that we have huge food grains production our godowns are full there is no dearth of uh, food grains as such and unfortunately when we talk about grains uh, arjun uh, may i uh, i will i be able to change from here or you will change it i will change it so you can just say next i will change okay uh, there there is a no dearth of uh, grains as such unfortunately in agriculture economics for whatever sake long back it is in 2001 uh, professor vm rao and myself were discussing they total the food grains just cereals millets pulses and that's food grains there are tubers there are other things which many people eat as total food and that food sometimes is far better than what we call it as a food grain but in any case as far as food grains are concerned we have a lot of stock but at the same time we have this migrants worker on the left side sitting with a plate in order to get the food for themselves the next the kind of tragedy is next hmm, that's it the kind of tragedy is no back back the kind of tragedy is something which is unexplainable and many people have tried to put their hands on it i have put the travel log of today's lecture in this uh, seven points getting at macro picture and blaring the rural i know some of my friends will get a little uncomfortable with that word blaring but i was trying to find a suitable word for the glasses given to a cataract patient after the operation the glasses are dull you can't see out of it and after searching for it i got it it's a blaring the blaring the rural i would be talking about how from the independence onward we went on masking or blaring the rural scene as such somewhere between 1970s it suddenly picked up and again died down slowly then i'm talking about economic retrogression economic retrogression just prior to covid 19 covid is a uh, is a thing which happened when things were not getting uh, fine were not good for us then i am taking a long term view of, of agriculture and the mainstay of rural india agriculture is the mainstay of rural india there there cannot be any other opinion other than that i get to food availability and nutrition after that come to this unexpected pandemic and the consequences the economic implications have been talked and talked and talked about in the literature and in the uh, media i would be speaking about the economic implications and finally what are the changes that have taken place in rural india in two context first context is over time rural villages and now due to pandemic next the first point is getting at a macro picture blaring rural india it's rural india still is what we can see on the left side and urban india is still what we see on the right side in fact professor reddy taught development economics for long and as a villager i was born in a small village as a villager many of us understand development as urbanism if i wear a pant and shirt i am developed if i wear a kachche panche or a small dhoti and a bandi i go around oh village guggo the kind of thing is that over time 
inadvertently maybe without knowledge but urbanism urbanity urban consumption urban goods and equating to the urban people became the synonym to development and that's where blaring of the rural areas began that's where the migrant started migrating from rural area in pursuit of that shining life on the right side migrants did not want to they had work they didn't want to move but they moved because there was a shining life elsewhere next next All right the macro picture of the rural primacy no when i said twice next i had said first time next since it did not change i said second time anyway. yes no no issues okay uh, rural india heavily depends on agriculture there is no no two opinions about it with 127 million cultivators of which 82% and professor reddy has emphasized that are small and marginal farmers 107 million are agriculture laborers look at that the kind of proportion of population that depends on rural india is enormous in 1718 total food production was 275 million tons india is the largest producer 25% of the global production consumer 27% of the world consumption largest importer 14% of pulses in the world on paper is food self sufficient and that on paper is something which is a punch because we are food self sufficient gadan india annual milk production is 165 and today the uh, milk producer in maharashtra are pouring down the milk on the roads in order to get proper price for the milk making india is the largest producer of milk jute pulses and with the world's second largest cattle population you take anything india happens to be one among the first few countries in the world india is the second largest producer of rice wheat sugar cane cotton groundnut etc etc the thing is that india is also a very strong consumer of many of the commodities which it produces but the per capita food grain availability is 491 grams per person per day which is less than 500 grams per person per day required or in fact the international standards are far above i i i i remember our uh, former planning commission uh, deputy chairman who was telling that the kind of things that are there in the western side of the world we need not apply to us certainly there is some minimum necessity and i am not emphasizing that point i am emphasizing food for everyone and that is not there next right this is a very famous figure right from vikaro onwards many many researchers in india have used it that the share of agriculture share of industries or manufacturing share of uh, service sector share of agriculture declining it has reached more or less 18% 13% share of manufacturing sector has been increasing steadily but then the share of services sector has been increasing very high the meaning of it and if somebody recollects the national income book by vikar viro in 1984 fortunately i had uh, some heckling by professor rao for collecting the data for the work he wrote a very sing a, a, a few sentences very simply that it's 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 natural that the share of agriculture would go down it should be natural that share of manufacturing and industrial sector should compensate the share of agriculture but that's not happening what's happening is the compensation is coming from the services sector and services sector is a big helium balloon i use my physics a uh, chemistry why helium balloon that helium balloon does not just blow up it blasts 
Now, this is exactly the thing that we are going ahead. Uh, look at that, that agriculture sector, the share is going down, but then most of the researchers and I have seen umpteen number of them, senior, junior, middle level, everyone. Agriculture sector share is going down. But then you compare with workforce in agriculture. It's not going down at the same rate. What's the implication? Implication is the carrying capacity of the agriculture lands in the rural area was increasing very fast. Professor Alag had written on that long back. But we did not read between the lines. The carrying capacity of rural India is increasing per hectare, per thousand, square, uh, thousand hectares, number of persons are getting more. Naturally, the Levisian framework applies, applies but in a wrong sense. Next. The share of rural economy not agriculture, share of rural economy is still 70% of workforce and 47% of the total domestic product, total. This is rural economy as such, not agriculture alone. And therefore, the dependence on rural economy of the country, even though steadily going down, has not reduced totally. Next. Next, uh, sorry. All right, let us see if we have gone down in agriculture sector's contribution to the uh, total GDP, aggregate GDP, aggregate national uh, income, etc. What happened to the industrial sector? Right from 1551 onwards, there are two things industry and gross value addition in the industry, total industrial growth growth of industrial sector and gross value addition in the industrial sector. It should have increased by all means because that is where we have emphasized right from 1950-51 onwards from the first plan onwards and increased in the second plan and went on doing it. It should have been something like a curve going up, the growth rates increasing, the gross value addition increasing it did not happen. It happened so that it's more or less almost parallel. Next. What happens in agriculture? We had had a green revolution around 67. You can see that green peak in 67, 68. Then there is another peak around 89, 90. And these are the agriculture and allied sector growth rates. After these two peaks and one small two peaks in between, the agriculture growth rates have been almost at 3% continuously. It's not last two years, last five years, last 10 years. It's last 1950 onwards till 20, 1920, which means have we really done sufficient in order to make agri it is it's providing food the productivity is increasing but then is it that we have done something to pick up the growth of the agriculture sector unfortunately we focused more on urbanity urbanism and urban sector next right now i come to the economic retrogression economic retrogression prior to the impact of COVID. Certainly, before COVID came in, there was the growth rates were slumping down. There is no doubt about it. Whatever way you calculate, whatever way you do the jugglery, the growth before COVID was coming down, not substantially, but steadily. And there were hopes and hopes that this will pick up. We shall inject investment and the growth will rebound back at 5%. Growth will rebound back. Fiscal deficit will be controlled. And these were the hopes given. Unfortunately, COVID came in between. But what was the retrogression? Next. 
the downward spiral again coming from right at the first quarter of 2013 to the last quarter of 2020 the uh, nominal gdp growth has been coming down and so also real gdp growth the corrections corrections incorporated by the finance minister and i believe so very sincerely because ministers don't make corrections i'm 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 of the great opinion that politicians are there to sit in the chair rather the work is done in the back office by the secretaries and the finance ministry and i do not want to blame them i may blame politician but i do not want to blame the excellent bureaucrats who are sitting behind but unfortunately their hands are tied with many things and that's where the things have gone down next the things have gone down so much that hard times are ahead we have been projected as going into the negative growth in the gdp not by 1% including rbi rbi says it is about minus 1.2% but then there are people like ikra flitch rating moody's investment oecd imf world bank who else who else each one is telling that we are going down in gdp we need to pick it up we need to pick it up and pick it up in every corner the kind of threat which was hanging large before the covid uh, came in it was simply that a person goes with a, a, a small pain in the shoulder to the uh, hospital and the doctor checks admits him and finds out that it was a cancer something like covid came almost handy that the growth rates have fallen because of the cancer not because of the uh, health of that person and the person neglected his exercises i am telling my example i have, i don't have cancer my friends need not worry hmm? uh, no good news in the immediate future anyway the thing is that covid came handy in order to explain that everything went fat because of this bloody thing next okay now as far as gdp growth is concerned fine but what is happening to consumers what is happening to the economy at large two simple indicators what is happening to investment and savings and what we see is from 2005 6 onwards it's not again last five years seven in 10 years and in fact i could have taken a longer time series longer time series that the investment and savings are going down economists all sitting there would know that if the savings and investment go down growth has to slump down and growth slumps down consumption has to slump down and consumption slumps down because demand has slumped down now simply providing income in the hands of the people may not pick up the demand because possibly they may spend it for their own purposes which they have kept hanging next i have come to food availability now food availability is stagnant and what what is here shown the net availability and country's food production country's food production is given in the red line and the food availability is on the flat long back i i remember professor amban nawar and pravin visaria they used to always compare uh, also tim dyson they used to always compare the growth rate in the food production with the growth rate in the uh, population okay let us not take the full population because the growth rates in the population with the uh, children having or the uh, fertility and mortality managing the growth let us take only the growth in the adults that is adult population adult equivalent units even that if it is compared certainly we should be fully self sufficient but then it did not happen next 
what is the availability of cereals pulses and food grains it's very simple that right from 51 onwards i tried to get to the net availability of food grains in cereals pulses and total food grains the top one is the total food grains it was lower it had dipped in till 1966 67 and then started picking up but then it was almost flat for all these years why is it flat is it that the elasticity of food with respect to income has been far lower than one or is it that everyone is happily having food it's not so because this is an erroneous that we get arithmetic and that's the exact title of it this is called arithmetic availability the the word the arithmetic availability concept is my own uh nomenclature this arithmetic availability next per person per day in grams also is something which is and i had put a red bar from there onwards it's not fluctuating but steadily increasing reaching to 500 but never cross 500 maybe we are substituting something else in place of food grains maybe we are eating more fruits and vegetables than food grains maybe we are meeting our protein requirements out of uh, uh, mutton chicken fish etc maybe we are meeting our carbohydrates requirements elsewhere by eating pizza etc or maybe there is something else but then at the aggregate level the arithmetic availability cannot be ignored next this on one side that we have arithmetic availability on the other side among the lowest 30% of the expenditure classes the average per capita consumption of energy is 18 11 kilocalories per day far below the requirement of course i i i i would go by pangdia pangdia says that we require less energy in order to work more maybe maybe but then we have less energy consumption as compared to the rest of the world especially rest of the developed countries or the countries which are slightly at par with us this is far lower than the indian council of medical research norm of 2155 calorie protein is 47.5 grams per day compared to 48 grams slightly lower and the fat is 28 grams per day again less than icmr norm and then for urban areas per capita intake of energy is 1745 it's not very great they may be eating less and 2090 per day norm of icmr this is from government of india publication done with the food uh, world food program the 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 problem is that we have we have an issue here we have a lot of food but still we have lot of malnutrition lot of wasting lot of stunting of the children the reason next the reason is that we are not able to make access to the food abhijit sen committee for long term grain policy dwelt on this issue and there are many in fact the debate started between sukhatme and dandekar about the access and the calorie intake but then the access is something which has been a question with us unfortunately the access is denied not because there is no grain available access is denied not because there is no institutional infrastructure available access is denied not because people do not have as much purchasing power or do not cannot reach the place of access access is denied largely because of the implementation failure and the corruption in the food markets especially public distribution system 
some years back, one of the, uh, I, I should not say this, but I don't mind, it came to my mouth. One of the ministers current had a uh, uh, boatload of food grains caught in Mangalore port, which were meant for public distribution system. How did they find the way to Mangalore port? How did this grain find way to Mangalore port? It's few years back and nothing happened. Nothing much happened. The case was large, case may be going on. I have no idea about it. And this kind of things happen every day in and out. Same thing happened in Maharashtra too. In Maratara region, four trucks were seized full of food grains meant for public distribution system. Now this is something which has a direct impact on the access to food grains by people who are needy and deserving it. The prevalence of malnutrition in children between 6 to uh, 59 months in India was 38.4% in 15-16 and underweight children were 35.7%. The prevalence of acute malnutrition or wasting has increased during the same period from 19.8% to 21.0%. Very disturbing facts. Disturbing facts, especially on the background that we have. We have everything and still we are not able to reach. The prevalence of anemia in young children is among 58.5% in 1516. Unfortunately, this, this happens to be from uh, the same report of Government of India with uh, World Food Organization. The problem is that even though we read, even though the policy makers are aware of it, even though things come in the media every now and then, we are not able to take corrective measures. Next. That also is a uh, connected fact with poverty. India is home for largest undernourished population in the world. 189.2 million people, that's about 14%, is undernourished. 20% of the children are under five are underweight. Same, same report. 34.7% of children under five years of age are stunted. 51% are women in reproductive age are anemic. The problem is that all this happens, next. All this happens when we are not able to control despite the fact that we have resources. We are not able to deal with despite the fact that we have brains. We are not able to deal with no minister of any, no politician, ever spoke that we should not do anything for malnutrition. No. No politician ever spoke that we should not do anything for poverty from 1950 onwards. But still, these are the states, the nine. They say Navaratna no? for the industries. These are the Navaratnas. Each one of them have poverty density higher than Indian average far higher than the Indian average. Indian average is 12.25.7 and 13 point something for urban. Now look at that, Assam 33.89, Bihar 34, Chhattisgarh 44 percent, Jharkhand 40, Madhya Pradesh 35 percent and so on so forth. It goes on over time. And it's not a very great research that I have done in order to pick out these nine states in order to have focused attention for poverty. I had a discussion when Professor Sain had submitted the universality, the report of long-term long grain policy and there was a workshop. I said that it is necessary to focus on the problem areas than universalizing. Universalizing will spread thinly the resources that we have. Rather, we concentrate our resources only in the places where it is needed. 
unfortunately for anything and everything we go to the temple don't be surprised what i said we go to the temple in the sense prasad has to be given to everyone little little everyone so that everyone feels that i got prasad and the hungry one if he asks second time no 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 that's not possible the problem is that this universalization of the things even if it is mg and rgs universalization of the things makes our intensity of work absolutely dilute and this dilution like in chemistry we do dilution of a salt till the time the precipitate settles down the moment precipitate start settling that is a saturated solution the precipitate has settled in the states which are not included here it has settled in the states why pour resources which are required elsewhere in larger proportion in the states which are absolutely not needing them next there are vulnerable pockets and sections in india vulnerable pockets are highest level of stunting is found in jharkhand bihar uttar pradesh madhya pradesh gujarat and maharashtra maharashtra not pune maharashtra not mumbai maharashtra not nashik maharashtra not aurangabad maharashtra in garchiroli maharashtra in chandrapur maharashtra in uh, malchiras maharashtra in the areas where it can be located and my uh, friend nitin professor nitin has located that there is there are spots hot spots in the state of maharashtra located two poorest quartile groups in haryana meghalaya karnataka rajasthan and punjab have high levels of stunting among the social groups and this need not be told this need not be told this is like showing mirror to myself that oh i look nice and that's exactly the thing 43.6% of the shield caste are stunting shield caste children are stunted next come shield uh, shield type children next come shield caste children 42.5% of the shield caste children and other backward class 38.6% are stunted the focus has to be there focus has to be on the children who do not get to eat who do not get that nutrition package which is required but then in order to distribute to everyone we 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 spread the resources thinly stunting in children of shield tribes in rajasthan odisha and meghalaya is very high stunting children in the shield tribes and shield caste is very high in maharashtra chatisgarh and karnataka next now this was the situation or this is the situation which we have continuously not last 10 years not last 6 years not last 20 years not last 50 years last 70 years things have been are being corrected and at times i said that in the second plan there was a list made that time gargil was there there was a list made of backward districts of the country in the 11th plan a list was made of the backward districts of the country surprisingly from the second plan to 11th plan we achieved nothing the same list continues in front of us then where is our planning what did we do all along the problem is that we did not have covid to blame but now we have covid to blame the problem covid has cast a long shadow over our growth prospects and i had shown you earlier that our growth prospects have been deepening deeping like anything now this unexpected unexpected pandemic many people say that ah uh, initially we 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 thought we'll control it then in between the statement comes from the most powerful person of the country we will be controlling it again comes we are controlling it we have controlled it unfortunately we have not done much and the consequences are 
absolutely bad, I, I, apart from the deaths, apart from the deaths, the consequences on the economy are extremely painful. And I don't know how much time we would take to recover out of it. Next. COVID-19 struck with sufficient warning, sufficient warning in the sense that a few uh, uh, months warning was there. We, need, we needed to close our borders very strongly. Nothing, nothing doing, it's closed, it's closed. Initially, neither the government nor the people took it really seriously. Forget initially, even today, yesterday, a wing commander, a wing commander's family is COVID affected. Uh, about a few steps, uh, just the next house to Professor Aziz's house. About a few steps ahead from my house, the wing commander was very firm that I am taking total care. I have, I have nothing. I am, I am absolutely. The complete family is affected because it was complacence. The complacence is shown so much that today I was told for the Ganesha festival, the markets in Mumbai are full. The markets in Pune are full. Everyone is rushing out of the house with maybe mask, without mask, but everyone is rushing out of the house. Now, if that is so, we are not taking it seriously. It exposed our health disaster preparedness, shattered the very fiber of our public health system. Our public health network is extremely good in the urban locale. Again, there is a strong urban bias as far as health is concerned. We are the country where people come for health tourism in order to replace kidney, they travel to India. In order to get an eye operation, they travel to India. In order to get the liver operation, they travel to India. In order to get a heart replacement, they travel to India. Heart uh, surgery, they travel to India. We have large number of multi-speciality hospitals. But we have about 23% of the villages without PHCs. We have the distance for the villagers in rural India. The average distance to PHC is 48 kilometers. Now this exposes what is our preparedness. And forget about anything else. If in the village India, if COVID strikes, and it is it is slowly crawling to village India. If COVID strikes, are there hospitals with oxygen mask? Are there hospitals with ventilators? Are there hospitals with proper drugs? Are there doctors with PPE? Nothing, we are unprepared. We are unprepared totally for rural India. We are very much prepared in Leelawati Hospital. We are very much prepared in Gunashila Hospital. We are very much prepared in Devi Shetty's Hospital. We are very much prepared in Apollo Hospital. Those are not the places where poorest of the poor enters or can dare to enter. The cities which boasted as having the best medical facilities collapsed under the pressure. Unfortunately, these are the cities which had once upon a time said that we have the best medical facilities. And remember, not only the private medical facilities, but the best public medical facilities are also given to these cities depriving rural India of that. Thinly spread in rural India, thickly spread in urban India. The analogy goes exactly the same way as it goes on the food. The rural and the urban, thinly spread versus thick density. Next. The COVID-19 cases, the kind of reported cases, recovered cases and active cases. Certainly, the active cases are flattening. Probably, the patients are responding. And India, for that matter, is a place where every kind of uh, immunity is built because of our excellent living conditions. We are, we are quite immune. And no, no wonder that Dharavi got faster immunity than elsewhere. The worry is slightly going up next. And that is something which is good from 
uh, 29th March till 20 uh, till 5th of July, the rate of recovery was increasing steadily. But after that, it is increasing at a very small pace. The reason being that the rate of recovery went went flat for the reason large number of cases are being reported during this period. The large number of cases are being reported mainly because large number of testing is done and therefore the denominator is increasing faster. But this is the silver line as far as COVID is concerned. Next. Now what is the kind of loss? Look at that. That loss in crores, Maharashtra tops the list with 4.72, 4 lakh 72 thousand crores loss. Next comes Tamil Nadu, next comes Gujarat, and then each one is losing about a few lakh crores. This was quite some time back. This was at the end of May. And an estimate. We, we need to be careful about estimate. We are unfortunately economists are not careful about this word estimate because large number of us, including some of the top level, in fact, the other day, Abhijit Banerjee said 10% can be spent out of GDP. I heard very carefully, 10% can be spent out of GDP? Where is that? Where is GDP stacked? It's an estimate. It's on the paper. There's no treasury which puts our GDP. We, if at all we have to spend, we have to spend out of the total revenue of the state, out of the treasury of the state. And therefore, these are estimates have to be taken with little care. But estimates give us direction. They don't give us exactness. They give us direction like poverty is an estimate. It gives us direction where it is high, where it is low. But 14.8 and 14.6 does not make any difference. They are same. The, the issue is that the estimated loss in the economy is about a few lakh crores, which can be anything about a budget of this country a few years back. Next. The economic implications. Economic implications are something, first thing is that the growth will slow down. Two, the employment is going to be really a problem. Heavy unemployment, large number of people will be on the streets. Three, large number of people will start searching for new jobs. Four, the dependency ratio will increase substantially because a good number of people will not be working and in the entire house, one person is working. Why? Good number of projects will be stalled. Good number of welfare measures will have to be stalled because people will not be there. Indra canteens are closed in Bangalore. People don't go. People don't go. The welfare measures also will be impacted. Next. And I have systematically gone through what are the economic impacts of pandemic. The growth rate is likely to go down in negative. 1.2% is an RBI estimate. And as an Indian, I will believe RBI estimate rather than anybody else's. There is likely to be severe unemployment. And severe unemployment will bring large number of people in search of food, in search of money, in search of vocation. And there is one vocation which gives you highest productivity, highest time productivity. In least time, you can earn larger amount and that is thefts, robberies, social stress will bring in that. And I am not, I, 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 I am not saying that it will happen, but I am warning that this is likely to happen because today 
when i look at or i understand my environments i see a large number of fellows who were earlier working as a temporary person somewhere as the boy in an office are now out of jobs one of the worst thing that 91 economic policy and the later on steps that have done is outsourcing this bloody outsourcing is a thing which is going to be very costly for us because a large number of works were outsourced in the hotels in the offices outsourced in cleaning was outsourced hospitals a good number of jobs were outsourced and all these outsourced persons who were employed at 6000 10000 12000 18000 22000 25000 and so on are out of job they are outsourced for the economy to bear them on and therefore why did people migrate out of cities like mumbai bangalore madras etc there was no cozy environment they had some dwelling but they had no money to pay the rent they had some dwelling but they had no money to eat they had some dwelling but they had nothing in front of them they can't go to market they can't buy anything it's better to go to my village where if not me somebody else will feed me the reason for the out migration out of covid is mainly because not that they were not looked after by the industry is one but not that that they were thrown out of outsourcing a large number of them are casual workers professor reddy would uh, bear me with this the casualization of workforce and feminization of workforce are two important observations done by labor economists in the entire country this casualization of workforce is one of the root cause of this entire episode the poverty is increased inequality has increased and that's what uh, we 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 get from the uh, action aid report disruption of small businesses unorganized businesses all those people who were selling it on the roads are out they are off those who used to come to the doors selling vegetables etc are off estimated global loss is 8.8 trillion this is what asian development bank has estimated estimated gdp loss in india is 30.3 lakh crores and about 13.7% of the gdp this is somewhere around march there are 3 months have gone april may june july 4 months have gone so this can be anywhere near 19% now next need to look for in post covid 19 reverse migration coupled with people no longer willing to move out of the village they have gone to the village they feel it's headache now to go back if they find job will have a number of impacts on the rural economy as the labor force in rural economy will swell manufacturing sector has shrunk and the fear psychosis has made smaller units to close people feel no 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 don't want to take risk with the laborers because they live somewhere they come somewhere and they have to work with us the software industry has a very good uh, facility work from home but then the msmes do not have that facility you have to be on the lathe you have to be on the cutting machine you have to be on the shop floor and if the laborer is coming on the shop floor the owner feels danger of it and therefore owner feels better i close it than i open it the health infrastructure has proved inadequate government has very delayed response in labor movement absolutely delayed response they should have started it long back and registered labor who want to go to their places but then that is the that is the worst 
situation that we have and that's what i started with the first slide agriculture supply chain collapse people started throwing their tomatoes onions etc in their fields uh, and the vegetables they were not able to sell they were not able to come to the cities to sell rural work workforce swelled like anything and the new entrants have come now these new entrants do not have the job matching skills they cannot flow now they have come to the uh, to the city working in zomato he was going on the motorbike but then when he goes to the village he takes the motorbike or he doesn't have the motorbike which he has sold it in the village he is not able to do anything because all along in the city he was in zomato or he was cleaning the office or he was distributing or he was a ward boy or any such thing those skills are of no use in rural india we have withdrawn them we have pushed them back rural dependency has increased and i have said it further that in the villages once upon a time guests were welcome now it is not so next unemployment by level of education you see the central figure that is vocational education technical degree pg and above graduates and above and higher school these are the people who are highly unemployed between 1780 a recent cmi report also shows that the number of unemployed in the cities have increased to a few crores and so also number of unemployed in the rural areas have gone up like anything because rural areas unemployment is higher than the urban areas unemployment for the reason that all those who migrated back to the villages are unemployed now next the unemployment rates etc next the state wise state wise unemployment and there are a few states which show lower unemployment and i am happy for that but i am quite unhappy for the four blue lines one yellow line two blue one uh, one one blue two yellow lines up to there we are absolutely careful again employment schemes have to be evenly spread and spread in the areas where they are needed most in fact if they are thinly spread across the country taking a country level policy possibly we will be going wrong and will be impacting exactly at a wrong place long back there is a friend of mine uh, professor ratna reddy and that is the best paper i feel i have written long back there was a scheme of planning commission to provide 5 lakh rupees per hobli for watershed management uh, sorry no uh, for increasing productivity on the lands of scheduled caste and scheduled tribes now the high density scheduled caste scheduled tribe block will get 5 lakhs the low density scheduled caste scheduled tribe block will also get 5 lakh the high density block naturally will have larger proportion of poor among scheduled caste scheduled tribes and there it will be thinly spread we we wrote it in economic times and then that scheme was closed by the planning commission somewhere around 7th or 8th plan around the 8th plan next this is something eye opener this was done well before uh, covid 2011 and 1991 we are waiting for 2021 results what has happened in the workforce this is from the census from 1991 when there were 1246 lakh cultivators they have come down to 1186 about 60 lakh cultivators have gone out where have they gone out they have gone out to this urban areas in order to migrate back they were recorded as cultivators some of them have sold out the lands some of them have mortgaged the lands some of them have tenanted the land and agriculture laborers have increased by 583 lakhs between two censuses 
This happened between 91 and 2011. 2021, we may find because of the COVID, we may find increased number of cultivators in the uh, population census. There is one interesting fact. I, I cannot, uh, though it is slightly away, but I cannot uh, stop mentioning it. When I looked at this table, I went back to agriculture census and I found that number of holdings have increased between 1991 and 2011. I was surprised that holdings have increased, but cultivators have declined. And I, I attended a meeting on that day and suddenly I got the answer because two of the MLAs were very proudly, MLAs and one of the ministers, very proudly saying that I'm cultivator. I have land. I go to my land. Hooray. These are the holdings which are recorded in agriculture census, but they have not told themselves as cultivators. They are not recorded themselves as cultivators in population census, which means there is a plethora of people who are non-cultivating landowners, the white-collared cultivators. Next. Food availability, availability, especially on the axis, I would like to emphasize. Availability is fine, that's one thing. But on the axis, road density, unfortunately, our public distribution system has thin density across the rural areas. Every village has one. But then there are some villages which are not recorded. They are recorded in hamlets. Consumer price index, dependency ratio, which will increase. Those who did not have cards or those who have cards in Mumbai will not get ration in uh, their villages. That is, I understand that is adjusted. Proportion of SCST population in the villages, percentage of forest area, investment on the road infrastructure, gender related issues and disability indicator. These are the factors which hinder access to food. Next. The changing rural India. A very nice picture I got. Rural India is changing because rural India wants to copy urban India. And urban India wants to copy rural India. Today, in and around Bangalore, the board is written on the hotel. You will get food cooked on village hearth, chula. Chule pe banaya hua khana milega. Rural India is coming. Once upon a time, there were hotels called Shagufa, Barista, Tanishta, and all. Today, village hut, Namhalli Upchara, village food, Gaon ka khana. This is something which is strange. Now, rural India is changing, changing very fast. And that change, we need to note, the change is two types. One, intrinsic change, which happened because of the demonstration from the urban areas. Everyone has a mobile. Everyone knows how to give message. They have not learned ABCD in their school, but they know how to give message. Rural India is changing and let's see what is the change. Next. Yes. Uh, Professor Srinivas, he was an urban born and an urban bred person who stayed in the villages in order to do his field work and understood village after he completed his graduation, post graduation. I was born in the village, born in a village, brought up in a village and then came to urban areas. I, 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 I have a very uh, strange observation. Large number of people who have written on villages and village studies were born in urban locale and urban areas, large number of people, not all. And therefore, their understanding was different from outside. I picked up from the writings of many sociologists. Village was an independent unit then, was self-sufficient, but guests are, were welcome, 
having its own village assembly development as and where it is officials and servants were there in the villages each caste lived its own life division among the class lines class lines were divided so also caste lines laborers generally belonged to the untouchables poor and obcs now it is changed depends on the nearest towns and in the distress if jobs are lost comes back to the village dependent on the state town economy information vendors and one thing i forgot out of it and the operators or middlemen the economic operators this is a class which most of the economists have ignored but this is a class which dictates the functioning of every market whether it is labor market land market product market or any other market the operators in the markets a village and uh, I, i don't have to explain it in punjab many people go to canada many people go to netherlands there are operators who operate them and about 500 people once in a stroke they get the visas they get the passports and were transported and suddenly they find themselves in somewhere else these operators were there in the villages are there in the villages are there in the cities are there with the migrants workers who promised them to take them to the villages we in economics we in sociology we in social sciences neglect this strongest group which is operating in the village politically oriented village panchayats and gram sabhas they function the ambitions of the villages are unabated and ambitions are built on the uh, copying and the urban areas yes there is a strong hierarchy yes there is a mixed pattern is emerging now between the caste etc but then there are strong divisions which still exist on class and caste lines the lower caste dominate even now in the manual jobs next the impoverishment of the farmer through the policy only two diagrams very simple one is at what rate the inputs at the factory market prices were increasing on the left side the blue bars and the black lines different factors of production in agriculture on the right side is the red line is consumer price index for agriculture laborer that is going straight up which is what i spend or at the rate at which i spend to eat from 19 96 onward 86 onwards and the blue line is the value added in agriculture it's almost flat the reason being that the agriculture is not allowed to increase its value added because of urbanism and urban dominance next redefining our economic contours there are about six points which i have mentioned bring back the primacy of agriculture sector agriculture is a savior settling the returned migrants in the in the rural areas or in their original jobs in hyderabad uh, in the indian society of agriculture economics professor vm rao had given the presidential address one paragraph he wrote about how to get out of this embargo in rural india in renfed agriculture he said that the only way is to bring small industries and working centers closer to villages rural industrialization is a very nice word is a sophisticated word but what is required is getting these small businesses in the rural india so that the employment can be brought to them rather than they go in search of employment create incentives for rejuvenating the manufacturing sector increase public investment 
on infrastructure etc strong need for rural industrialization and institutionalization of mg energies we have had this for long a student of mine did a field work and asked one question how long have you been going on mg energies work I said last 6 years now this program was supposed to be poverty alleviation program if a person and his family 6 year dependent on mg energies only then can we say with full confidence that the program is successful but then it's like mother's milk it is necessary in rural areas to provide jobs why not we institutionalize it take over by the government provide labor from mg energies for like land army in karnataka provide labor for all the public infrastructure projects provide labor for all the development projects including private and public sector but the labor will be provided by this institution which operates under mg energies and the wages shall be fixed by this institution which operates under mg energies as an umbrella a lot of problem will be sorted out next the issues to be confronted are again six increasing inequality eroding role of the state and increasing the stronghold of the private players in the economy increasing consumerism in the economy and will poverty reduce or it will stay asymptotic i have a doubt that after the covid goes and in fact if there is an nss around after that which may not be there we may find that poverty ratio has increased significantly regional and across group inequalities in bihar jharkhand chatisgarh and vidarbha there are strong inequalities across groups across regions there are bypass regions and classes everywhere and safety net programs like the insurance mg energies social safety programs are essentially to reach the needy ones not to spread them thinly next that's it thank you thank you thank you <clears throat> professor desh pandey for covering upon so many issues and uh, and uh, uh, so so kindly giving this very pertinent lecture many points which sir has raised i i would just quickly go to our chair also but just uh, to reflect upon what sir has uh, rightly uh, raised uh, uh, sir, uh, i don't think i find any of the economists taking use of the fundamental education which we have for example chemistry biology medicine sir has used all these examples for us to understand uh, what has been highlighting uh, uh, in this independent india two various economist one thing which sir is uh, highlighting and uh, which will be also very debatable of course always is uh, universalization and targeting uh, the the thick spread and and you know the thin density cluster uh, many points sir is uh, highlighting and one one uh, notes i have written is that uh, the estimates are for directions estimates are not actual that is for direction Uh, in fact the economist is coming out that the world economy would shrink by 10% and they are calling it 90% economy sir has also tried to cover so many aspects related to gdp uh, and uh, another you know outside outsourcing uh, things sir has raised i'm i'm sure professor uh, dn reddy would touch upon those and uh, uh, one thing which i i think no agricultural economist is is raising is of exclusion and inclusion error Uh, largely pertaining to what the sir the term which sir is coining white collar cultivators uh, we all know that uh, you know many there are many cultivators uh, who have land but uh, those who do not cultivate and uh, there is a lot of error uh, in this and uh, economic agents those who are operators again rightfully bringing our uh, uh, notice to this uh, market mechanisms and uh, Uh, without any further ado i would now uh, like to go to our chair and uh, for his uh, brief remarks then we'll go to our discussion 
to reflecting upon. Thank you so much, Professor Deshpande, for your lecture. We are extremely thankful. I am very uh, happy that my law student, uh, ages back, Prayabrata Mandal, attended. Thank you, Prayabrat. Thank you, sir. Professor Reddy. Uh, <clears throat> let me join you uh, in congratulating Deshpande. Uh, because he started uh, for saying that it's a challenging theme, and I think he met this uh, with a remarkable kind of a range, you know, in time and then the way in which he covered in a fantastically integrated manner, uh, taking into agriculture uh, from the days when we started planning for development in India down to that of the present crisis. It's very difficult to sum up, but let me highlight uh, the way in which you tried to put in. And as I was trying to, let me link up as he began with the way in which we look at uh, this agriculture, uh, food security, and then rural development. As I was trying to suggest, there are two contrasting ways in which it is being looked at. Uh, Ram Deshpande takes the view that uh, uh, you have to look at uh, the entire range from where we started. And he begins with that of the what he was metaphorically talking in terms of the haze with which agriculture was looked upon. It was not visible, and therefore, in the planning, it took always the back seat. And this was the one he was referring to that was largely called as urban bias, neglecting perhaps attention to that of uh, uh, agriculture. And of course, uh, there was a shock of, uh, uh, in the 60s, the serious shortage of food. And therefore, there is some kind of waking up to this situation through that of a, maybe he didn't mention that in the name. Uh, we started with that of so-called green revolution, at least in terms of food production. And then of course, in the case of other uh, allied activities as well, he was suggesting that as far as the production is concerned, that India has reached a point where it's comparable to that of most of the other major agricultural producing countries. In fact, we, as he mentioned, that we are always on the top four or five, either it is of course in the production of rice, wheat, or in the horticulture or in animal husbandry. But I think uh, the way in which you look at it is not the total production, but you look at from the point of view of one, the producers. The second one is as what it would mean to that of accessibility, is where he brings in the, there's a very telling graph where you look at, let's say, the continuous more or less flat line of per capita availability of food grades. It doesn't seem to have big breakthrough as we would like to see along with that a breakthrough in the production of food grains. So is the situation that see it hovers around 180 odd kind of kgs per capita per year. And same thing with that of the per capita availability for consumption in terms of cal calories. It is hardly, let's say, uh, 490 to 500 cal calories per day. And this shows that the challenge is not to say that we have enough food, but the challenge is, let's say, that we are not able to, let's say, cross this line, low level, kind of a, as we could see that when he, he does bring in, if you go down deeper, this uh, range of availability also varies with regions and communities. And even if you draw a simple line between rural and urban, see in fact this figure like that of cal calories per day in rural areas about 1700 and odd, which is much, much lower than that of 21 or 2200 Cal calories that one, from the point of view of uh, health, would require in rural areas. Same thing is, of course, urban areas. That means we have been perpetually 
in spite of the increase in agriculture production running at the margins of let's say what would be called of availability in which the worst is the distributional aspect when you look at let's say the availability and then you go down to that of let's say food security in terms of nutrition he brings in the issues of let's say how continuous deprivation in terms of malnutrition underweight of children ranging from 30 to 40 it never comes down and in spite of, let's say, whatever grains that are available. There may be other factors, but I think certainly that there is a serious attention required for this distributional access kind of an aspect. And then, of course, uh, he would also refer to that of what perhaps has not accompanied what could be referred to uh, uh, the kind of health facilities that could go on that would be available. I mean, there's disparities between rural and urban, and particularly we are talking in terms of now he brings in COVID and then at a juncture. And of course, even the best of the medical facilities, quote unquote, best available in urban areas, we have a serious challenge of lack of adequate facilities, even in urban areas. The question is, if you go into, as he was referring to, there are almost 20, 25% of villages which do not have any access to the medical facilities. And the worst, of course, the, the availability of medical facilities may be the minimal kind of a thing. And then he turns to that of, let's say, let me come back to that of what he refers to that of both the major concluding dimensions or challenges. Uh, when it comes to, I mean, he puts it in terms of a six points, but uh, towards the end, I think, what is uh, coming out is, uh, when we look at either the loss of GDP, the range would be right from RBI to that of, let's say, ICRA, from one point to that of 9.5%, 9, 9 or the, in terms of, let's say, what it means is in terms of unemployment. I mean, it's the huge kind of a decline. The range is, let's say, again, it's, it varies hugely across, let's say, the states, this regional. And then when it comes to the question of, let's say, we may not have clear data about the present impact on social groups. In fact, you pick up what he is referring to that of, let's say, the decline in, let's say, farmers. In fact, we know even otherwise, there is a huge shedding of, let's say, employment in agriculture from 2004, five to that of 17, 18 almost let's say five crores of those who are dependent on agriculture have left agriculture. Uh, no, most of them are let's say, farmers. And of course, substantial part of them may be women in agriculture. There's a huge decline. And then I think many of them, there's not much of a linking of that. What we are referring to that are those who are now returning from the urban informal kind of activities estimates run into that of five, six crores, it almost is in parallel. If these people come back to rural again, there is some kind of relief and then in spite of what he refers to that of the rural then and now, the rural then and now is quite different. I mean, in fact, aspirational rural or ambitious rural, they're not ready to take easily uh, to those who are coming back to crowd themselves in, although they were dependent on remittances from them. And also there are lots of possibilities of adjustment. And the major thing is, of course, where do you get uh, the kind of employment? But I think the last point he was making about in trying to face challenges, he refers to that of NG and RGS, a time has come to institutionalize in a manner that it will not be just coming, giving, let's say, a few days of employment, 100 or 150, whatever, but it should be linked with that of, let's say, engaging with that of bringing rural visible by integrating kind of infrastructure rural needs, as he was talking in terms of services being improved, small scale industries being revived with the kind of a infrastructure facilities so that there is a possibility of increasing absorption, as he was perhaps joking, jokingly said, it's not easy 
to talk in terms of rural industrialization, but it is necessary to rightly talk in terms of rural non-farm employment in an effective, productive manner. That much of rural non-farm is low productive right now. It has to be revived by, let's say, bringing in whatever MSM is insecure, but they can acquire security with adequate kind of a support systems provided by the state. And in fact, when it comes to agriculture, it is the investment in infrastructure in rural areas. Of course, also support that of agriculture that would help. And in fact, uh, uh, the question of, uh, again, the situation of farming, there doesn't seem to be anything substantial coming in. Of course, he has not gone into the details when it comes to the support systems that are needed and in the crisis. They see that uh, you have a, a situation where it's rural already uh, before, let's say, the COVID, as he was referring to that of steep decline in growth rate. Now added to that a further decline that's likely to happen. Everybody agrees on that. It's likely to aggravate the situation. There is no way that you could talk in terms of uh, merely looking at agriculture production either in Ravi or in let's say Karif seasons. It's much deeper what is happening to this 80-85% and what happens when these returned migrants also join uh, into this kind of a situation much more is needed and therefore I think uh, we may discuss as to the kind of challenges that we face in rural areas which were already in some kind of a perpetual kind of a distress all these years because of neglect, particularly the neglect in terms of social uh, kind of investments and health and other infrastructure and support to that of farmers. Thank you very much and we have a long panel I think uh, Arjun would uh, take over and then perhaps call them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the very, Thank you, sir. Very, very Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, sir has uh, highlighted this very essential point of institutionalizing mm -hmm. Mandrega. And uh, sir is also using a very new term that the poverty uh, shouldn't uh, become, you know, asymptotic. And, and many new dimensions, many questions are pouring in here. Uh, in last one day, we have more than 700 registration for search lecture and uh, we have full house here also in Facebook more than 1000 people watching sir live. Many questions are coming. I'm collecting all those. Uh, now we will quickly go uh, to take uh, comments and reflection and if question any from our discussions. And uh, so discussions I would uh, in the interest of time, I would request everyone to be brief and uh, uh, and uh, avoid uh, uh, redundancy in, in terms of the, the comments which has been made. Uh, so can we have poster? Yes, as, as you all know that we have a long list of uh, people and you know, uh, various students and uh, those who admire Professor Deshpande for his very uh, uh, unique work and, and, uh, and research. Uh, but let me invite Professor S. Madheshwan, sir, uh, director at uh, ISEC Bangalore, uh, to give his uh, 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 remarks as a discussion. Uh, Professor Madheshwan, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, two of my uh, senior uh, colleagues, and as well as uh, mentors, and uh, also they are related to ISEC. It's my former director. As well as Professor Reddy is our present Board of Governor uh, of the ISAC. And also, they know me for long, right from my PhD days. Uh, uh, when, uh, when Arjun Kumar was calling me that, uh, uh, I told him that uh, I would be an outlier uh, in, this, uh, in this topic. Uh, but uh, he told me that Professor Deshpande define outlier as uh, it is a high leverage point and influential point that he will interpret in a different way. So I accepted uh, and of course I'm very fortunate enough to hear uh, a very interesting lecture by Professor Deshpande and also a very interesting observation by Professor Eddy. Uh, 
see, sir, uh, I just will spend some five minutes to, uh, instead of uh, talking that, you know, I just would like to say a few words so that, you know, Professor Deshpande also will reflect upon it. Sir, uh, basically, when we talk about the COVID-19 impact on agriculture, of course, uh, it's it's widely, very widely across different regions and among producers and among agricultural laborers. So what we need is that we need uh, at this time, government need to put a contingent plan in this place. So uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, COVID on the economy is no doubt devastating and no sector has escaped it. Uh, uh, its impact. Its impact on agriculture is complex and uh, varied across diverse segments that form the agriculture value chain. Uh, even among the different segments, uh, it impacts very widely among different regions and among producers and agricultural levels. So the impact will be uh, rever uh, rever uh, reverberated, reverberate across the large economy and will linger long than few months. Uh, of course, uh, the problem at this moment primarily related to uh, two things. One is that labor availability and second is inability to access markets for produce due to issues in transportation as well as operation of markets. What I want to put it uh, very succinctly that, you know, the need of the hour from the, uh, uh, from the impact of uh, COVID on marketing of agriculture produce is better uh, that you know i would like to hear more from you that you know how do we strengthen the supply chain in terms of uh, uh, in terms of infrastructure in terms of institutions and in terms of technology at the present day situation sir that's what you know we are struggling with that i don't want to give uh, various uh, uh, examples that uh, one word is enough. Of course, you know that uh, uh, you have involved uh, uh, your, your own policy of agriculture policy in Karnataka and also your own uh, write up uh, has gone as an input to the uh, input to the agriculture department to strengthen the market. Of course, we have a lot of models in uh, in, in Karnataka like Agri Warsal by this agriculture university and also uh, this some uh, uh, flat owners association they are motivating and also we have uh, uh, we have very strong uh, rostria e market service in Karnataka. that is a model in which that which is emanated from your writings from your agriculture policy right now compared to other states uh, our rostria e market service in, uh, is uh, is an example which is very strengthened and of course there are some attempts by the producer companies and private players to establish e-marketing platform in the state and uh, this should be supported so that the, the aggregation model emerges wherein produce of small farmers are assembled and marketed in a competitive manner. So with this uh, kind of a preamble that I would like to uh, reflect upon uh, how to strengthen the supply chain in terms of uh, what it called uh, in uh, in terms of technology infrastructure and the institutions uh, and the uh, second thing uh, which i would like to say sir i i was very much uh, um, appreciative of your slide and the way in which i mean giving slides and number is different but the way in which the people have to learn from you that you know your interpretation, the ingenious, I call it as ingenious interpretation. That is very much important that on, we all have right from our uh, PhD days learned from you. Of course, I was uh, not only uh, I'm, I'm your uh, student like, but I was also colleague right from your Gokhale days. So I have a great opportunity to learn from you as a, uh, yeah, but you will not give it to me. Uh, this is a final one because that due to positive time, there are so many people are there. So this, uh, when you talk about this nutrition and so on and so forth, uh, the very recent comprehensive national nutrition survey suggested that 
a third of Indian children are stunted and underweight. And of course, the challenge of COVID crisis are likely to deteriorate this situation. I could make out from your slide and also from your interviews. So, what is your thought about, and also there are various informal sector workers are likely to be pushed in deep poverty due to COVID situation. So with this, uh, 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 so what do you want, I could, your conclusion is good, but the thing is that what I expected from you now to say that some, some of the key thoughts, basically the first one is uh, the expansion of coverage of social safety net. This is my last point. Sir, uh, what is that I need from your thought is that one is expansion of coverage of social safety net. And uh, the second is diversification, diversification of the food basket of social safety net and feeding behavior. And the third, I urge from your, from your interpretation and presentation is that from basically from your food security and nutrition, a surveillance system for food and nutrition security and engagement with the NGOs. So that's the, 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 that's how there is a potential emerge of emergence of new hotspots with respect to food nutrition and security that comes out. And the fourth point is the integration of tracking system of the three food-based safety net under NFSA. So how do we integrate the tracking system of three food-based safety net under NFSA? And uh, of course. Uh, it will be a great help to the government also because uh, the think tank like you can think of how to integrate the tracking system of the three food based safety net under NFSA. And finally, sir, uh, 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 see, you always say, and your own writing, how to support the agriculture and allied sector that I have learned from you that, you know, uh, uh, what is the crucial. What, what, what is the emerging concerns in the availability of farm inputs such as labor, agriculture input, machinery, and the finance? Uh, so that the farming system continues to run uninterpreted and long term food security is got to be ensured. That's my uh, uh, point. But there are some points uh, which I uh, would like to uh, add, but due to time constraint, uh, I, I stop it here because uh, the the, just a final point, because it has come into my mind, I chalked on when he was uh, writing, uh, sorry, when he was doing a presentation, the end of the lockdown, sir, uh, will, not, will not end the problem. Uh, on the contrary, they are likely to compound at the onset of the new agricultural sowing season. Now, the most important issue that farmers have to surmount is the problem of repaying their crop loan and gold loan, at least for those who have borrowed from the formal bank sector. I just uh, uh, put this, and uh, I don't want to talk more about it because you are the authority in this topic. And uh, any failure to do so will mean that they will be forced to borrow money uh, uh, money from the informal sector, the high rate of interest for the new season. So lack of any relief will only make the agriculture crisis worse. That is basically, that is your writing. I'm just bringing back for, for the present day situation. So this is my uh, discussion. This uh, your outlier has made a point, sir. And <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Ajit Kumar, for the opportunity to hear thank Professor Kuspande and also to hear Professor uh, Reddy's observation. It's highly educative. And uh, very fortunately, I work with Professor Deshpande in a, in, a, in, a, in a small stint at the government in the policy level we used to guide the agricultural allied department for the result framework document of our government. So I learned all these things uh, from the government and also from him. Every time he comes to meeting, he teaches me. And he teaches all the government officials. So uh, based on his teaching, I'm asking the question to him back now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Madheshwar. And in fact, uh, we all also learn from you. So I think it's a good Indian culture of learning from all gurus, and thank you for highlighting very pertinent points uh, uh, pertaining to the strengthening of supply chain. 
from institutional technical and uh, also uh, infrastructure point of view and also highlighting one of the very important uh, uh, the national nutrition mission which uh, uh, tata trust was doing uh, with uh, niti ayog and also aspirational district delta re ranking the come up sir has touched upon those backward districts from second plan to even now and uh, nothing is as also chair has highlighted that uh, uh, it has hit a, 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 a below you know a level and it is not getting affected uh, now i'll quickly go to the uh, next discussion for this uh, session uh, professor sachi professor sachidaran sinha sir sachi sir are you there yes i am there you know i i just uh, yeah uh, so now uh, thank you um, thank you professor uh, professor desh pande and uh, of course I the chair professor reddy sir your video is off if sachi if... it's a great reward to have oh. you <laughs> uh well uh, i don't know whether it's a reward it's, a, it's it was a lot of learning and of course i wanted to see you after a long long time because uh, uh, yeah we were we 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 chatted uh, when you were not so well about uh, for five months ago and so i wanted to see you physically but uh, of course you know this video nowadays is a to whatever craving that we have for meeting our friends and colleagues well i have the privilege uh, 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 to be amongst such distinguished economists and i'm not an economist i have i've never studied economics so i have very little to contribute uh, but for the fact that yes a certain amount of understanding that i have uh, as a geographer and i really appreciate professor deshpande for having uh, put across some of the some of the ideas which we geographers have always been struggling with that is the speciality of poverty that you know it's not everywhere it's not all per pervasive so you've got to really concentrate your uh, uh, effort of the state or the government's efforts Uh, needs to be concentrated in those areas those regions where you know they are needed the most because if you if you really try to try to take it to everybody you know you are really thinly distributing and that was a remarkable point but nevertheless uh, there can be um, uh, contestations on this particular issue also we have seen it with targeted pds and um, and our experiences of various other kinds but nevertheless you know that's something you know if we have the will we will certainly know how to really get through to this and that is certainly needed uh my uh, basic uh, observations and these are my observations a uh, kind of a uh, a certain uh, uh, proposition which i would like to put forward as a geographer for you economists uh, because you people are the ones who know who really guide the state guide the government guide the economy in a very very uh, uh, significant way and uh, having lived with economists in the center where i where i start, where i teach um, you know i have been a beneficiary in one way or the other but one aspect which i think you know we need to really talk about is the fact that a rural economy and the rural society in the current contemporary situation is seen in terms of sectors which are relevant to uh, how economists value those activities and certainly ignore several others into a kind of a basket which may not be relevant or which may be others uh, now what i really mean to say is the following that you know in my uh, childhood and the way i i mean i go to a village almost every year or two i mean two to three villages and uh, what i really see there is uh, that there are several activities which are which people are engaged in increasingly in the past over the years precisely because of the changes which have occurred in the countryside um, in the rural areas not to use the word countryside but in the rural areas primarily as a consequence of you know uh, changing controls over these resources you know as as a geographer i can tell you and coming from bihar you know the ponds that we have 
we had in Bihar were a source of livelihood, may not be a continuous employment, but a source of livelihood for a fairly large number of people in different seasons. I'm not really invoking the very idea, although that is also very important, that there were always common property resources. And if we want what to perhaps look at, the common property resources, what they really meant in the rural areas from the NSS uh, 86, where you know they have uh, some data for the tribal communities and other communities. And you will find that you know of every one rupee that they consumed a fairly good amount of money, I mean, a fairly good amount of value, 34 paise to a, almost about 60 paise varying from one a community to another came from these common property resources, access to forest, access to water bodies, you know, and so on and so forth. The point that I'm really trying to say is that, you know, we in Bihar, I mean, since I know that state and the rural areas better, our water bodies produce various kinds of products. And one of those valuable products is Makhana, which in fact has a very high value. Of course, now, uh, what we really see is that all those ponds are being filled up. It's not only the ecological services, which in fact is getting affected, but it's also increasingly under the architecture of the technology driven water management system has completely destroyed the traditional system. Not that we have to go back to the tradition and that everything was good with the tradition, but there was something, the indigenous way of managing water. Now this management of water really meant that in the lean season, you know, people had something to depend on. And that cycle of interdependence at a lower level of uh, nutritional intake certainly ensured their survival. It did not lead to them becoming absolutely crippled to the extent, you know, that we have a kind of a situation in which we find today where increasingly large number of children are now stunted and and all those examples and all those uh, statistics, which, which is there for everybody to see. The second point which I would like to say is that how do we as you economists, I mean, I'm posing this question, really bring in this factor. You know, Parthadas Gupta's work on, on environment and well-being is, is, uh, bring in, brings in all those uh, um, uh, aspects and he's an economist. But you know, this interface between the ecology, the environment, resources, and livelihood is something which large number of economists have completely ignored. And therefore, it is not simply the rural versus the urban. It is the variety of stratifications and inequalities in the rural areas, which really doesn't really get captured. And that's where I agree with Professor Deshpande that the visions were initially and for, for a very long period of time remain absolutely blurred. Now, what is then are we really talking about? And this has really created a kind of a justification over the years that, you know, in the name of what you call efficient production, where, you know, I really don't understand what is this efficient production. I mean, if you ask me, you know, I would rather grow something, you know, which serves my family to the extent may not really create much of a marketable surplus. I mean, but then, you know, what is that efficient production that you really want to say in terms of productivity, labor productivity, per hectare productivity, land productivity, and so on and so forth. All those things are fine. But my question is that in the name of further accentuating inputs into agriculture and allied areas, should it not really mean that you know we create additional sources of livelihood? But has it really happened? My understanding is that it has not happened. We have really shrunk, and more so, more importantly, in the in the in the in the in the hinterland, which we call the tribal hinterland, you know, where nothing happens, nobody bothers, you know could have the highest level of uh, malnutrition, malnourished children, it doesn't bother us because you know, we, are, we are certainly not part of that tribal society. There are varieties of tribes, you know, how does it care whether they die in Gachiroli or whether they die here and there. Now, what is this that we are really, and then you know, we have a kind of a policy today 
which has been proposed through a signed of kind of a draft notification of environmental impact assessment. I mean, I, I mean, are we really serious about as to what in which direction our economy is going? And on top of that, we are bringing in such things which really takes away whatever little control that the village society has been has been has been exercising over their resources. Water is not in their control. Land is not in their control. What are they going to produce has completely been distorted in the in the in the in the in the over, overarching structure of what we call market market market. Survival is very important. Now these steps you know which we are really talking about which the government is talking about we are saying okay you know in the interest of their msmes you know we really really need to acquire land we really got to create even for uh, in the interest of the rural um, uh, rural industrialization you know land will have to be acquired and so on and so forth i really find this this can wait or maybe you know we need to have a real fresh we have to take a pause we have to really understand the, 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 the traditional uh, textbookish kind of a value system, values that we economists have learned or we were taught needs to be really looked at afresh, you know. And that is very important because that, that only is going to have an answer to, 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 to the, the issues that we have in hand. Thirdly, sir, I really don't, I have been asking this question with, and I haven't got an answer, maybe somebody can, can answer, but that's not the crux of the matter, is the fact that, you know, we always create this rural urban divide, <laughs> precisely because, you know, uh, when I was working on a steel industry and, you know, whether to have it, have the steel factory located at the, at the, at the mine head or somewhere near the market, you know, looking into the question of freight equalization policy and how these areas which are resource rich areas were losing out on this because it really had an impact on the spatial distribution of industries where uh, we were taught that you know these industries and and you know the employment opportunities certainly uh, have a lot uh, to offer but it didn't happen we know this story now my question therefore is that you know the coal which is which is produced in Bihar and in Orissa is transacted from Calcutta. Now, where does where do you account for? Where do you put that revenue? The, you know, you are creating somewhere, but it is transacted from an urban area, from the head office of some somebody, the coal CCI, or maybe the Steel Authority of India located somewhere or the other. You know, you are really creating this artificial structure of accounting in order to make the situation absolutely blur. And thus, you say, okay, agriculture, allied activities in the rural areas do not contribute so much. There are so many of us living in the rural, rural areas, sir, close to about 65% or more. Now it was going to add under COVID a really serious problem. How do we really, we, we need to really, uh, have a fresh look at this question as well. Lastly, sir, when you know you were right that the welfare activities and the welfare initiatives are going to suffer, we have this education policy which came in, and uh, now it is final. And uh, what really preceded this education policy is a uh, is a Niti Aayog uh, experimentation of closing down schools, right? Now, why I'm really talking about this? I'm not talking about this because I'm really, I really want to bring in the question of education here, but I want to bring in the question of nutrition here. Now, with most of these schools being closed down, 42,000 alone until January 2020 were closed down in one single state called Jharkhand. In Orissa, there have been thousands of schools across the, the country, maybe. You know, I, I really do not know what is really happening in Karnataka, Dishpande sir, what is really happening in, um, in, in other parts of the country. But I know of Rajasthan where, where in the name of consolidation, several schools were integrated, closed down. What it really means is that, and most of these schools are in the, in the, in the tribal areas where at least, you know, some amount of nutrition 
under the midday meal programs used to reach there with these schools closing down there is absolutely because you know they are, they cannot travel to such far distances even 8 kilometers or 10 kilometers away until there is and there is a real problem of access physical access so the situation is and do we have uh, do we have any kind of a program that we're really talking about we have certainly nothing sir so uh, it was a, it was a great delight listening to professor reddy uh, it was a lot of learning for me professor desh pande uh, it was great sir uh, these are some of my observations i'm not an economist and i really want to meet arjun and take him to task why did you put me as a commentator as a discussant because i know nothing and yet i have to speak something but i thought might as well share because desh pande sir would certainly give us some idea on some maybe some direction not an estimated direction he will give us some good direction uh, which will be a real closer to real so thank you thank you for having given me this opportunity and um, and um, uh, thank you elu malai for introducing professor desh pande he has been your teacher or a colleague but professor desh pande i know even during my college days you know when he came to jnu i mean i know him since then so i'm not putting a larger claim but yes uh, yes somewhat a some claim thank you very much professor reddy professor this one day and other fellow um, uh, commentators it was nice being with you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, you sachi yes this is exactly why uh, uh, we invited you because a very pertinent points has been raised by professor sina pertaining to a uh, common property resource and uh, you know e ecology environment uh, moreover the special things sir has also touched upon uh, but uh, most importantly the nutrition and education part of it from the school education in uh, villages so these are very uh, uh, pertinent points sir has raised uh, quickly we will go to our next panelist to shilong nehu uh, professor utpal kumar day professor day is a professor of economics at northeastern hill university in shillong department <coughs> yes sir please go ahead kindly try to be brief yeah uh, am i audible arjun yes yes I, yes please am ahead. i audible yes. uh, uh, thank thank you thank you very much uh, i am fortunate here that you have invited me as a discussant and also i am very fortunate to listen to professor despande here and he has covered a wide range of issues here that uh, agriculture agriculture developments production activities availability of food nutritional index and its change over time and then covid situations and therefore there are rural development so many issues he has covered and is very difficult within a very uh, short time though there are so many issues uh, highlighted and to comment on that Uh, I, I do not think I can do that uh, uh, justice to that. Anyway, uh, again, I, I thank you. At least um, uh, here, uh, sitting for last uh, almost two hours, I could uh, get. Uh, in, it is too much on informative, and so many informations I gathered here, and so very uh, means uh, learning to me. Uh, just uh, some of these points also uh, that uh, Professor Despond has told. I, I also has re written and in some places and also in other seminars you remember earlier also uh, that this uh, this uh, COVID situation for the agriculture what happened that market uh, linkage uh, disturbances and and their uh, distress uh, selling is taking place because uh, that uh, farmers cannot sell their product and transport to the towns so their uh, prices has gone down whereas in the cities you can see that very high prices so at least there is a food inflation that we can see and so regional price uh, uh, distortions that is inequality of uh, regional inequality of the prices that we can see uh, i i uh, straight away go, uh, gone to the points that uh, that one and even uh, that that linkages or the value chains that uh, they are uh, distortion there i see that uh, at at many places many of the agro processing industries they are suffering from the from the scarcity of the inputs that is uh, suppose from paddy to the rice mill that processing so they have closed down because 
even though it is said that um, essential uh, items transport is not a problem and it is but uh, many of the um, agro based uh, or processing industries they run on, on the uh, on the supply of inputs that come from other states also interstate and even though it is permitted but people are facing huge problem now from the side of the farmers of what i see that the demand distress also there it, it is a new type of vicious circle has started operating because the farmers their earning has come down and once their earning come down their uh, effective demand in the market for several things and their choices also has been shifted due to various other reasons i i, I will come to that later and and so since they cannot spend on their some uh, essential items that they had to cut down because uh, because you know that recent education policy and the online teaching so people have to buy a, a newer mobiles for example 35000 40000 even though they cannot afford so earlier they had one but that set of the uh, phone is not working now because in the new situation you new in, in need the new apparatus though they don't have that what you call digital literacy or all these things that is another adaptation is required and so they are uh, whatever as such they are low income whatever they are having that has also been diverted from some necessary items to other things which became now suddenly necessary uh, to the data pack so expenditure has has gone up so they are uh, i i think so that is one thing that vicious circles because they are earning came down so their demand for the other goods came down so their market shrink is and that again further their income is going down because they cannot do their full scale operation and avail the better technology so whether it is a temporary phenomenon and how long it will continue uh, no, nobody knows because uh, there are many uh, there are many estimations that indian economy will be shrinked by 5% 2% 3% and these numbers also i do not agree uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, because they it depends on the longevity of this pandemic you don't know they have a certain estimation that it will continue up to 3 months or 6 months on that basis all these estimations are going on now if it continues for long that period of times and 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 that's why uh, i think you have uh, seen that uh, my earlier writing that came in 11th column and others there i raised a question uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that professor despande also mentioned here about the uh, uh, faulty implementations or the policy failures here uh, uh, as that Uh, the pandemic when it was well known even i also uh, visited other states at that time in february even this year that time already uh, that uh, temperature and other uh, checking was going on but there was no lockdown whole country barely one two or three cases were there but uh, suddenly uh, we lockdown was imposed and that is okay that we reduced to the spread of the disease and maybe uh, the percentage of the death which could be more has been declined has been reduced but on the other hand because of this impose of the lockdown the activity declined poverty increased inequality increased and so nutritional deficiency increased and that induced death whether that is more or not because later on you have seen that when when it became intolerable the migration started and and that uh, professor despande has mentioned that's a lewisian i i think it is anti lewisian he wanted to mean that from rural to urban to the modern sector i say a reverse one migration am i right professor yeah so so that one so the, what happened that in the transportation deficiency people started walking thousands of kilometers many people on accident they uh, died so the future only will tell because of imposition of lockdown whether we could save the life or the jaan hai to jahan hai or that because of imposition of the lockdown because of that economic decline especially the informal sectors affect and there is more death in the long, long run so we don't know which way the balance is gone and now because of that problem you can see when it is rising more and more still we are unlocking so because there is no other way so it, 
Now, now the uh, question is that I, I, whatever I, I have an estimate, I saw if this trend uh, continues by September middle, you may see that, or even before that, per day one lakh will be newer cases in India. So what will happen, how it will impact? That is another thing. Now in agriculture, that day also I mentioned that, uh, that each family is many people who are working outside, as he also mentioned, that they came back home. And so they have to be absorbed in agriculture. Now, in the newer scenario, where these uh, laborers are also on contract, they work. Okay, they are on a contract. So many of the farmers in the rural areas, they switched over to many newer type of technologies and adapted a situation. Now, when this suddenly new family members come in and they started working, they are suddenly holding size is not increasing. Uh, so how they can contribute to the agricultural output more, rather what I see that disguise unemployment is on the enhancement. Disguise unemployment scenario, they are dependence on agriculture rising, but it will not contribute to the production much. Rather in the rural or semi-urban areas, whoever came down from the metros, as in another paper I wrote recently, that they are forced to adopt some low paying occupations as people who are earning per day 1000 1200 or 700 they are now busy, uh, they are now selling vegetables as a vendor they are selling the eggs so they are not getting any job even 10 days in a in a month so their average earning has come down again the same scenario in the vicious circle and they are now sandwiched in between two situations because who are working in the urban area for a long time sitting in the metros now when they come back home so first few days they are welcome then even other family members will not tolerate that as if he is an external intruder even though he is another brother of the same family because for a long time they are enjoying the same land because he came now he will be forced to take part in that now the same person who is not getting full-time job in the rural areas, they are also scared of going back, though many people, it is a political, it may be advertisement and coming, the slogan, the no, no, almost 30% have gone back, their industries have been opened, but there is an uncertainty that if they go back to their uh, town again or cities, that whether the same house owner will be will allow them to stay there because of the uh, this epidemic panic covid panic so they, they can they are not sure whether they will go back or not many of them are in two minds whether to go back or whether not to go back and this process will be uh, continued for the long period of time that that i i, I see here so that is another uh, another question whether it will uh, continue now, so many questions are there, though I, I, I don't want to uh, uh, go into that. Anyway, um, I like that declining, this uh, recession already started before the COVID, and COVID just accelerated the process of this recession. So that is one thing. But this unemployment impact, in, even in the rural or urban, whatever cases you see, there are several other dimensions, I think. Because what happened that in the last lecture of another university that I said there, that because of the educational differences, the em employment or opportunities or the involvement of the people are different. Because uh, if you go by the caste, creed, or religion differences, the different caste or creed people, SCSTs and others, their involvement in activities also different. The percentage of people engaged in informal sector, formal government job, so you can see that those who are more in the informal, they are more affected. And who are more in the informal, SCSTs, those who are uneducated. So educated and uneducated divide is, has been widened. So that inequality also, not only that, there are social, um, uh, social uh, means uh, segregations have been widened much more in terms of their economic opportunities, you can say. Now, Professor Despondent, has read the question that universalization of the work. He, he brought here the question of the Manrega. And that uh, is a dent in that um, objective of that work. 
Now, universalization, he wanted to mean actually that uh, the some of the states who are in a more problem, who needs more these type of scopes or the social security schemes, uh, they are not getting to their full potential because these schemes are also extended to the states where it has it is not required in that way. But what is my question is, if you go by the average figure of the state, you get the one scenario. But in those states where you see that on an average, they are in a better position, you, you, that does not mean that all are in the better position. Maybe there is high inequality, all the sources of earning or the livelihood access are accrued to a few individuals and others, uh, many do not have people you may find. Even the solution, of this in Manrega, that uh, that I uh, the way it is going now, I am not fully convinced, because in Manrega, what is happening everywhere? Then whatever assessments are done by the people that you can see, that how much money is distributed? Huh? Uh, you want me to shortcut? Yes, yes. You want Please, yes. me to shortcut? Yeah, yeah. So you you on two three points, okay? So uh, you can see there that. In Manrega, the how much money is given and how many people got the job. I, I don't say that employment in that way, it's a distribution. Your main purpose of the Manrega was to create the rural resources on which people can survive in future. But the question is that whatever resources are generated, if there are some activities, suppose one road is constructed and, and now, now many of the jobs, it is diversified, they are brought under the umbrella of the Manrega. Suppose one lakes are created or one lakes are reformed. Now its productivity will increase. Now whether it has been assessed the next year, those who got this reformed lake and they got higher productivity, did they say that I don't need any job in Manarega, next year I can survive from this higher productivity of my lake? So that would be the success. Success lies in the death of the Manarega demand. Now we see that is rather the demand or requirement is increasing over the years. Now it is in contradiction to the primary objective of that. Now Manrega, it is good um, until and unless it is done, that is that resources are generated, they can survive on that resource base so that they don't need to depend on the government provider because it is unsustainable. Because in another study, I stressed on the production. Because how how long you can give the, that he also mentioned that fruits, uh, free food that is the rice, etc., five kg per month per day. How long you can continue unless the production is being stressed upon? The production activities have to continue. Otherwise, there will be a problem in near future. And secondly, the, the another one the, in the long run rural activity pattern that is bound to change. That again, I am coming back to that new educational policies, all these things. Sir, but because please try to. News, sir, please uh, try to. This is the last, last, this is the last point. See that uh, now many people now gone out of school. Those out of school people who gone, now uh, it is very difficult to bring them back to the school. Many of them do not have their actual instruments to access the new educational thing. And government is announcing that within next few months, all the infrastructure, your uh, internet facilities will be reaching to the every villages, uh, every uh, digital things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is, I think, a, a far vague, and uh, I, we can see in few months. Uh, uh, no need to tell all these things now. Whether it will be okay. And in in a previous seminar to you, I had also questioned this one. Have you taken this question whether unsocial activities has increased or not? Do you remember? Because many of these unemployed people, when they will be uh, hanging into so definitely many of them may take recourse of these unsocial activities, burglary, this, that may increase. So social, sociological disturbances or social issues, many will be there. So uh, this is uh, mostly like submissions and he may reply some of these things we are waiting. <laughs> Uh, because he knows much more in the deeper, he has the deeper knowledge in it and is a better than thing. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, at least I got, uh, he was, uh, I'm sorry, you asked so much question, also give him time to ask. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You I think. For, yes, sparing so I much. I did not bother you. Uh, the, no, that, the, that point, why I told you, Arjun, because mm -hmm. last two months I am hearing in uh, putting this, uh, I mean, this headphone and all others. 
as such we are facing problem now you see how the children face this problem they are many of them are having now eye problem they are health crisis in the rural areas they are not habituated if you on the headphone and whole day in a mobile and that script small small you have to read and knowledge you have to gather so health problem also will be there not only that educational distress how that will be and in the long run human resource in the rural areas and the productivity that is bound to happen what is his comment sir thank you very much to continue thank thank you again to invite me okay okay thank you okay. for said for such such thrilling uh, comments uh, without wasting any time uh, but uh, let me ask uh, uh, chair uh, professor reddy and also uh, professor desh pande that uh, we are extending the session for some more time and if there are many questions i'll try to collate and uh, then we'll go to uh, professor desh pande and also to our chair so uh, professor reddy shall we extend for some more time no you can extend but uh, put some time limit because uh, you can't go on extending it beyond a point huh? right right and then uh, desh pande has to answer at least uh, for four five minutes he must also get time at the end right huh? right can you consider that see that the discussions take not more than four five minutes right right thank you thank you thank you chair and without wasting any time let me go to uh, gurgaon uh, to dr pradeep kumar mehta director at research monitoring and uh, uh, evaluation at segal foundation uh, dr mehta over to you uh, uh, thank you very much i am very happy to be part of this uh, seminar and uh, very privileged to hear dr desh pande who is my guru and he is the one who has actually taught me the agriculture economics so um, he is a stalwart in agricultural economics and i think he has comprehensively covered all the issues which are being challenged by the covid 19 on the lives of agricultural sector and the people residing in the rural areas so without uh, i just focus on two to three points and have few questions and then move it uh, to the other discussants so first issue which i have understood is that uh, most of the people in the rural areas and in the agriculture sector are the ones who are uh, either small and marginal farmers who are in the informal sector who are casual workers or who are migrants they are the major chunk and they are the ones who are actually having lack to access of basic health facilities they are having uh, most of them do not have insurances they have very meager or no savings and also lack any social protection now the question arises that the kind of uh, steps the government of india has taken to address the situation of agriculture sector which uh, which talks about removal of all the stock uh, limits uh, for the food grains and also allow the private sector and the uh, futures in the agriculture sector and also uh, allow the sale produce anywhere but do you think professor desh pandit that this will help these kind of people who are more vulnerable to the covid like crisis or will they really get uh, benefit out of the policies which has been undertaken by the government in this case Now the second issue which i have understood from the presentation by dr desh pande is that uh, two major pillars of food security which is availability and accessibility are more severely damaged by corona virus it is because of the lockdown and the restriction of movement of labor for marketing production and processing both the distribution and uh, uh, production has uh, been severely impacted now lessons learned to be learned from the famine uh, bengal famine in the history that it is not the production but the accessibility which is more important here i like to add just one point is that uh, uh, the midday meal like million of the children are now who were getting midday meals in the school are now no longer going to go back to school because they are not shut down so do you think that the covid like crisis is going to lead to more and more hunger and malnutrition malnourishment among these kind of children who are in the villages or there's any mechanism to which the government has uh, going to increase the food supply to meet their demands in the villages uh, that is the second point of this and the third point is that uh, and the point here is that the government has announced 1 lakh crore rupees of investment in the agriculture infrastructure is that sufficient to influence the determinants which you have highly highlighted in your presentation about determinants of food production and accessibility are they sufficient enough to ensure that there will be huge a uh, spur in both the production and accessibility by the people or is there any other ways in which this needs to be done 
and the third uh, aspect uh, is is about like uh, what is the best way that a lot of people have now migrated to the rural areas is it really possible to provide them uh, in a good employment opportunities for the long run in the villages or do you suggest that they should go back and uh, to the urban areas and rejoin their activities once the crisis are uh, going to get over so thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for uh, the great insights which i have heard from dr desh pandey and other eminent scholars who are present here thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr mehta for being uh, so brief uh, uh, in your comments and highlighting very pertinent points uh, pertaining to apmc uh, mid day meals and nutritional and other concerns uh, let me go to uh, uh, but professor a narayan murthy is having glitches he has been messaging me uh, but uh, he was here uh, uh, in in this i also spoke to him today uh, but next let let me go to professor g sri devi uh, ma'am Uh, Professor G. Sri Devi is associate professor at Department of Economics at Central University of Hyderabad. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Arjun. And uh, I should uh, say that Professor Deshpande sir has covered all the issues, uh, and he is my guru who taught us actually the issues of the food security. We have started our research from him. uh but uh, uh, i have uh, just three important points to be uh, asked sir uh, the first one is uh, we we have been um, saying that we are food secured in terms of the physical access to food grain india produced 291.95 million tons of food grains in 2019 and 20 but at the important question is 69% of the deaths of the children under the age of 5 have been attributed to the malnutrition by the unicef in the state of world child report actually and global hunger index has also ranked india at 1 or 2 and position out to 1 117 the lowest in the south asian countries our rank is lower than the bangladesh and pakistan actually and also nepal Uh, so in in that contest uh, how do we are trying to improve the nutritional security of the uh, children uh, because uh, when uh, while uh, professor um, yeah, professor dn ready was talking he said that uh, we are very happy that we are exporting more of rice during the covid period also but the other side of the story we keep hearing is that especially at micro level in andhra pradesh and telangana uh, when we did a small study over the telephones with the gram volunteers of andhra pradesh when andhra pradesh government started supplying the 10 kg rice per person during the covid in the month of april uh, so if if a family has the four members they got the 40 kg of the rice but they could not keep all the 40 kg for their own consumption they kept only 20 kg or 15 kg for their consumption and the remaining rice was sold to the middleman at the kg 10 rupees or the 15 rupees so these middleman actually try to collect the free rice which was supplied to the uh, the uh, the poor people based upon the white card holders and all that which is a free rice for them and it was supplied to the millers millers again used it to export it actually so in the march actually the rice exports were around uh, uh, 20 lakh tons and in the month of the april it has gone up to the uh, 35 lakh tons so the government one side was saying that we are very happy that our rice exports have gone up but Uh, i mean what is the exact story are we not consuming the rice that is because of that we are actually able to export the rice or uh, this rice mafia is working very strongly and utilizing the existing situation and uh, the the third important point uh, whenever we talk about the food security and access to food security uh, we we talk Uh, always in terms of the prices and incomes but we we ignore the important aspect of the inequality the persistent inequality existing within the various social groups of the society within the regions 
where the majority of the marginalized groups being most affected whenever there is a change in the uh, supply side aspects and the demand side aspects. So inequality is actually major cause of the malnutrition and that inequality also leads to the unequal access to the education, access to food and healthcare, which actually push them to be remained in a perpetuating uh, a, a situation of the vicious circle of the uh, poverty. And the third, the Andhra Pradesh government and Telangana also for a few months, they started supplying the cooked food through Anganwadis uh, to most of the uh, villages for the children below five years to reduce the malnutrition impacts. But uh, when there was a actually a return back of the majority of the migrant labor from the metropolitan cities to the rural areas, there was an immediate uh, uh, high demand for the supplies of the Anganwadis, where Anganwadis were not able to meet them. And uh, the, the other important aspect is even through Anganwadis, when supplies are taking place, there are different Anganwadis for different social pockets. Like uh, in one of the village, we came to know that for scheduled caste households and for scheduled tribe, there is one Anganwadi which will be supplying them. And for the Reddies and the other OBC caste group, there is another Anganwadis. So in, in terms of the uh, state support policies, also we see a, a perpetuating existence of the uh, discrimination in terms of access to the resources. So I, I, I shall be very happy if Sir can comment on these things. And I also one more last thing because the central government is insisting on a one card and one nation. But whereas the Varissa government and Chhattisgarh, they are not very much favorable to accept that. Uh, I, and also, I also feel that like Andhra Pradesh and Telangana government gives the free rice to the Antodaya and also rice is supplied as to kg one rupee for the white card holders. But when we are saying one card and one nation can be able to uh, meet the local requirements of the people uh, because Telangana is actually thinking to reduce the malnutrition to go for the cooked millet food in Anganwadi section. They wanted to supply the hot millet food uh, within the maybe two, three months, they have been planning to include that. And also Andhra Pradesh government has also included the uh, till in their uh, cooked food, as well as the egg, everyday egg and milk will be supplied to the children to reduce the malnutrition. So with one card, one nation, one market can be able to reduce the hunger. Uh, especially within the women and uh, marginalized groups. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sri Devi, for highlighting these points from uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana point of view. Very pertinent points, ma'am, has raised. Uh, will not. I. I. I am sure uh, Professor Deshpande will touch upon uh, those issues. Many of those issues are also coming in many comments and questions. Uh, without wasting any time, I will go to. Uh, uh, Bangalore again to Professor Amelindu Jyotsi. Uh, sir is a, 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 a professor at School of Development at Azim Premji University, Bangalore. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Arjun. And uh, I, I was just uh, being one among the last among the discussants. The benefit is that uh, you have lesser and lesser points to indulge into. But uh, it is it requires uh, the wisdom and uh, deep knowledge and engagement uh, of the subject and uh, of, as teacher of Professor Despande, who, who can drill into the topic of agriculture, food security, and uh, uh, rural development seamlessly and uh, telling a telling story to all of us. And, uh, and particularly his engagement, deep engagement with the policy itself kind of brings out the nuances in a way that uh, as an academics, we fail to see some of those points. <clears throat> so I would be, uh, it's, so the good part of it is that uh, because the topics are fast, so you can pick one of the threads and then uh, be a discussion on one of the topics. And I was generally interested in uh, the food security aspect of it. 
uh, and uh, thanks that Dr. Sridevi has already highlighted some of the points. So I was specifically interested in uh, this food and nutrition security, particularly because that's how uh, Professor Despan they highlighted the points and. Uh, Whatever reports that we see, it's a global uh, nutrition report of 2018 or a global hun hunger index of uh, 2018 or 20, you will find that uh, India's position is absolutely poor. And some of the factors which are also leading to this um, um, uh, malnutrition that we would be seeing is that uh, uh, the, like stunting or wasting or whatever way we try to look at it, you will find that uh, uh, if a very few nutrient factors which are critically important in the food uh, uh, food composition or food basket composition and um, like for example anemia that we are seeing is one of the biggest killer uh, or even the for that matter safe drinking water itself is one of the major reasons for a um, lot of children dying um, below the age of five <clears throat> so uh, so the politics of food security that if you look at it that uh, it is taken long time even in the policies to bring food and nutrition security as one component. Even FAO itself uh, in its definition uh, or in its discussion uh, tells, uh, say it points it out as food security and nutrition basically to keep the food security, uh, those four dimensions of uh, availability, accessibility, utilization and stability as the uh, key areas of discussion and nutrition becomes an extension to that. Of course, the academics have already been uh, talking about FNS or food and nutrition security together. So in this context, um, I thought uh, is not it important that uh, there is a requirement for a slight, you can say tectonic shift from the availability dimension that is the uh, just composition or production side of it to move more into the uh, uh, consumption as well as the value chain or distribution side of the story. And a uh, second important thing is that, uh, um, that we are still getting into the calorification understanding of it, like where we are looking at uh, energy as a composition, but should not we add uh, components which are uh, essential for addressing this malnutrition. For example, iron, if you have to add, uh, so iron rich food also has to be a part of uh, 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 this uh, composition of food. So, so whether these cereals or pulses, uh, cereals per se, uh, are sufficient enough to take care of food and nutrition security. And uh, uh, when I was talking to a, uh, a colleague of mine who is uh, uh, in the uh, world fish, uh, has the nutrition um, uh, dimension of it, she says that uh, it is not a pill of iron that would suffice. Your composition of food that matters more than uh, to address those uh, deficiencies. So, so in that, um, because also my engagement in this field for the last five years now, that I see a, a, when we are talking about agriculture, uh, food security and rural development issues, we are leaving out a big chunk of population in the coast uh, who, who are engaged in fishing activities and that fish reaches in some or other way to uh, uh, to the hinterlands and of course also in the hinterlands like uh, Professor Sinha was also telling that uh, a lot of people depend on, on this uh, wild catch in the riverine or estuarine fisheries so and these land are contested land so or, or has been made contested with a variety of conflicts where varieties of people coming into it and, and that makes uh, many of them vulnerable the fishing community particularly uh, is being a lot uh, vulnerable and, uh, in, and this uh, fish uh, in fresh form or in fact dried form, it reaches to a place called Jagi Road in uh, near in Assam, uh, which is one of the largest dried fish market in India. So, uh, which means uh, fish finds its ways to go there. So in this context, say, uh, how to bring this whole food and nutrition security as a one coherent uh, dimension because that is where the problem largely lies now that uh, because all the data, whichever, if you look at even NFHS data you look at or uh, all the reports of nutrition index or uh, hunger index you look at, uh, they are suggesting that how acute this problem is and, uh, uh, and uh, how to bring this as a kind of a central focal point, food and nutrition together. And the second is that how to move into that 
bring that SIP, not SIP, basically to addition uh, uh, instead of focusing only on production side of the story, how to move into the consumption side of the story and the uh, and the value chain part of it. And uh, that is where if you look at this recent HLP, that is a, a high level panel of experts of FAO, uh, in 2020, they have added a new dimension called agency to it also. And it's uh, nice that uh, uh, Despande Sari in his nuanced way, he brought out how different actors do play an important role in uh, in reaching the food to the uh, uh, right set of people. I mean, I mean, in fact, the Odisha government is which one who is trying to introduce fish in ICDS and uh, even midday meal program and doing some kind of piloting there. So. Uh, so the point uh, that uh, possibly I would like to make or a uh, submission that I would like to make is that uh, uh, in this agency, I think we have to recognize some of the wonderful work that has been done by ASHA workers who are the last mile connect connection between uh, um, uh, the, the hung hungry or the people who are need in that food and nutrition and the food that is available or being made available. And uh, uh, and uh, even during this lockdown time also, they are the one who are able to, in whatever extent, whatever limited extent, they are the one who are able to uh, make it reach. But these are very, very ad hoc uh, set of uh, uh, activities that uh, we are seeing now. But, uh, um, but it requires a little more comprehensive thinking if you have to get into the bring nutrition to the center of the dimension and make a little tectonic shift towards consumption instead of starting the thinking process from production to then value chain to uh, nutri uh, then to consumption. I think somewhere we have to start thinking from consumption agency and uh, uh, and uh, to the production process. Maybe that is where would that be a new, new way of uh, seeing so that we can address this issue a lot more urgently uh, yeah, so that is the point. Possibly, I would add to uh, uh, and uh, given the time duration that we had, um, and we have crossed over the time. I think I don't want to extend it further. But I'm really happy that uh, I could listen through this presentation, and uh, I was part of a such an August uh, gathering uh, and to be a part of uh, one among the discussions. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Professor uh, Amelendu, for and I congratulate you for all the very interesting and insightful and, and very uh, essential work which you are doing on nutrition, on fisheries, and many of uh, highlighting agriculture, but also allied activities, which is required also for, you know, doubling the farmer incomes, or in fact, you know, for the progress of our rural communities. Uh, Sir has also highlighted one very pertinent uh, point uh, on, on drinking water, on water, drinking water itself. Uh, apart from agency uh, value chain and, and other aspects. Thank you, uh, Prasam Lindu, for joining and highlighting these points. We now move to our uh, last discussant, uh, last but not the least, uh, to Lucknow, Professor Balwan Singh Mehta. Uh, are you there, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Your video is, uh, yes, yes, please. Yes. Your Professor Balwan Singh Mehta is research director at IMPRI and also a senior fellow at Institute for Human Development uh, here in Delhi. And uh, uh, most of us are also associated with ISD, ISLE, and uh, Alexa. Yes, Professor Mehta, over to you. Kindly try to be brief. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun. And uh, it's very, uh, very, uh, very knowledgeable session. And uh, I really, it's a great, great uh, to listen to two giant folks. Uh, Eddie and uh, Professor Despande, I mean, particularly in the rural areas and agriculture sectors, they have done a lot listening to them and it's really a privilege. So one of the things, I, I will not go into the detail, I will just to give two things which, uh, uh, one of the things which I worked a lot in particular the employment and livelihood issues and another one is which is uh, really is a talk of the town, one, one would say like this, Art Mineral Bharat. So that, these are two things I'm, I will just speak a little bit about it and just also uh, you know, uh, ask some of the questions to like what will be the way forward and what to do. So these are the things which uh, I'm going to speak about. So one is the things which uh, in the opening remark, Professor uh, Reti and Professor Deshpande uh, highlighted about you know, 
but agriculture is the one only silver lining you know regarding the performance during the covid uh, and uh, when compared to other sectors so this is one of the things which uh, which uh, really says about what agriculture the self reliance on agriculture of our country in the last when we talk about the other sectors and all that the agriculture this is during the covid time we realize how important is agriculture how we are reliant still reliant reliant on agriculture uh, sector so this is the one of the things which uh, which uh, but but the, these are the positive side of the agriculture there are there are other other things which which really uh, emerged during the during the covid period in a large uh, you know mass of people migrated from uh, reverse migrated uh, return migrated to urban areas to rural area and now they are, they are I, i think some of them will uh, return to the cities but i think a large part of significant part of them uh, significant number of them will stay in you know, rural area and uh, also engage in agriculture so that is one of the things which uh, uh, always we always say like agriculture uh, is uh, over dependent like you know, when you see the productivity and other other is uh, the 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 land size and other which 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 uh, in detail discussed by professor this one is about so these are the things which we always talk about to like moving uh, a large number of uh, people who rely particularly in agriculture in rural area like 60, more than 60 65% so so to move them from uh, agriculture to non agriculture so 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 that is what uh, uh, is the basic uh, problem which happens uh, you know, why they, why a large number of people uh, uh, in such a system agriculture and other lack of other employment opportunity migrate to out of the like the opportunity in our village so that is what uh, is a one of the things which happened which which uh, the as government a lot of government uh, like the, the state governments are talking about so like we have uh, now you know uh, you know uh, skill we have done the skill mapping and now we are we are uh, re- employing them and all kind of things are coming up but what exactly is the scenario like uh, what will be what what are the sectors actually when we see the you know in the, in the data before covid after the agriculture the people uh, in rural area the second sector is construction sector again the construction sector is very low paid in the you know uh, it's very uh, in the rural in the people are engaging so so what kind of uh, what kind of jobs uh, the people uh, or the government or, or they are going to provide them or or most of them will come uh, to the urban cities or return to urban cities after the covid or so after some time so that is my like one of the thing which i would like to uh, like some kind of answer or some suggestions what what should be the you know the way forward when we talk about uh, those who uh, have returned to the rural area and likely to stay there what kind of jobs what kind of things said they have to Yeah, government has to do. So the second question is, like, you know, the, the government is talking a lot about this hard labor, self-reliance, and, uh, and you know, if you say the, about the relief package, you know, uh, mainly focus on the rural uh, agriculture, rural agriculture, like you know, one is for formation of micro food enterprises and cluster-based uh, farming uh, clusters, PM much cheaper. Uh, uh, some some other you know, and uh, marketing reforms and uh, you know essential commodity act reform a lot of other things government uh, uh, is really highlighting about and and even uh, in the, if you talk about the rural economy as well uh, as the uh, previous speakers all speakers said about like high unequal inequality low skill level and high poverty uh, all kind of things and the food security problem nutrition problem all these kind of things like uh, particularly when we say like there is garib kalyan rozgar yojana the government has pumped around 50 crores rupees and in, enhanced the uh, nrg as ways and uh, pm kisan is around 9.9 crores farmers have benefited out of it and even cash transfer to rural women uh, through janthan yojana janthan accounts and they have done more than 60 plus million return migrant skill mapping so these are the some of the things highlighted uh, highlighted and some of the things reported by the government like so they are planning like 
the huge uh, reform and huge, uh, uh, like this will be the silver lining for the agriculture sector, this COVID in the, in the future. So, so this will dramatically can change uh, this, uh, this period if it's really implemented properly and uh, these things and all. So what, I, I just uh, want to say some kind of reflection on this, this issue also. So these are the two things uh, I will stop here and, uh, and uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun again for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Mehta for highlighting these very pertinent points from policy. Uh, Atmirbhar Krishi is something what uh, 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 when uh, you know the, the, the last Sunday uh, Prime Minister also transferred around uh, eighteen thousand crore rupees to eight point five crore farmers from the Nabad portal, and the hashtag was Atmirbhar Krishi that, that it was being highlighted, and many schemes sir has uh, uh, raised here, and uh, I'm I'm sure that Professor Desh Pandey will look into it and. Uh, assess and also tell us that whether we are going in the right direction or what all can be the remedy towards the way forward. So uh, without wasting any time, uh, Professor Deshpande, we are going to you. I'm collecting all the questions. We have many questions. I'll club them. And then as and when, I'll, I'll, I'll pose it to you. You can choose to answer and reflect upon all the suggestions which we have combined. Uh, so over to you, Professor Deshpande. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think... Uh... The, uh, I have also noted down the questions, uh, but I would uh, rather go by you because you are quite busy in writing. Uh, last, uh, um, Professor Balwan Singh Mehta's uh, uh, audibility was extremely uh, problematic. I was not able to hear. Uh, one thing I can tell you that uh, the questions are, I, I, I saw 11 persons have asked questions on their question, um, your response thing. There are three important things which I felt. Number one is universalization. Vis-a-vis -vis targeting. I have been always in the favor of targeting for the reason that universalization creates more when I do not need it. And if you are forcing it onto me, I take it and then I sell it in the, what uh, Professor Shivdevi told, I sell it in the black market. My maid servant does that. She gets 40 kgs of rice, she sells it because uh, she doesn't need it. Every week 40 kgs, one doesn't need it. The, the thing is, therefore, I'm in favor of uh, targeting rather than universalization. Second thing, which uh, question came from Nirupa Malhotra, a very uh, high level officer in Navard about the new ordinances about market. This should have been long back. But then understanding the market and I, I, I think Sachi, Sachi told about market, market and market. Uh, true, understanding the market economists have not done it. In fact, economists learned about market from Cambridge and Oxford. Their behavior of market is totally different than my behavior of market. If I, an educated person, enters the APMC yard in order to sell, say, my 20, uh, two quintals of ragi or 20 quintals of ragi, I know what kind of things I face. Our markets, and that's what Sridevi also has said, that our markets are behaving differently. We have a large number of operators. In every market, I, I tell you in academics too, in academics too, let the vice chancellor's post be advertised and the market is established. And there are operators, there are people who will take this side, that side. We, and that's what I remember, and I should, all of us must remember Dr. Ambedkar who said that we are imposing democracy on a country which is culturally not democratic which is culturally hierarchical. And when we are culturally hierarchical, the three ordinances are welcome, but implementation is something which is going to be difficult. They are welcome. They are, they are well deserving, like universalization of public distribution system, well deserving, but it doesn't work. Uh, Professor Amalendu has said that we need to go beyond, I, I said it, Wheat and rice are not the grains only. There are large number of people eat large number of things. And uh, Professor Nitin's uh, uh, field work 
we found that the tribals who stay far off from the uh, towns are nutritionally better. The tri tribal children who stay far off from the towns are nutritionally better. So also in Sri Devi's field work. Th therefore, we need to consider all the aspects of food uh, as far as way ahead is concerned. I think I, I collected about 25 questions and each one of them is uh, suggesting some way, way ahead, like aggregation, what Madhishan talked, like uh, supply chain management, like uh, um, uh, Pradeep Mehta had talked about very three important uh, points. Will it lead to more hunger in the schools? Midday meal scheme, if it is stopped, what will happen? There are plethora of questions which open up. I know, and I was keeping the time. I think we have exceeded far too much beyond the time. Testing those who are patiently listening is erroneous. Second thing is, I'm sitting without a back support. My, my chair is that side and I'm sitting without a back support for two hours sitting continuously tightly is a bit difficult. I'm young, but at my age, uh, I, I think Arjun, if there are anything which is very important and you feel that, yes, I must uh, dwell on it, please go ahead. No, I, I suggest uh, Arjun. Yes. I think we have sat here more than three hours. Of course. Of course. And the questions are several. I mean, there are very important questions, and the, there's no way saying questions are not important. Second, the nature of questions, some of them are substantially the ones which uh, I think they should focused on the impact of, let's say, COVID and where we have arrived, what is happening. We have not got into that of, let's say, the interventions by the state right from PM Kisan and then the three ordinances and the way in which food is distributed. These are all policy interventions or, let's say, so-called state initiatives, which were not the focus of his lecture. For instance, Sri Devi's questions are very fundamental, very interesting, go deeper. For instance, he is talking about food security. Can it be satisfied through that of distribution of, let's say, rice substantially also? See, this is much too vast kind of thing. And I am happy she raised that question because she is doing a lot of field work. In fact, this is the one where she should also go in for pilot. For instance, that 40 cage collection of rice and selling 20 cages it has generated a new kind of, let's say, black marketing. But what is more important to get back to whether this policy is right. Most of the sensible people are saying, yes, food distribution is important. Yes, cooked food is important, but that's not adequate. You have to pump in some kind of purchasing power along with that. See, a poor man comes in, you give rice, and he has some other thing to buy. Therefore, he sells half of his food to buy that. And therefore, there is a lot of sense in saying there must be at least for the time being, for a few months, universal or let's say selective cash distribution. Let's say it could be 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. You give them along with this. Otherwise, they will sell their whatever they are getting it. Next five days, they will not have any food. This is going to be the question of hunger. And people are talking in terms of inflation and food market. All this will happen. And the kind of ordinances passed, they take time. We are talking in terms of immediate attention and not, let's say, medium term or long term policies. So, therefore, these issues have not been brought onto the agenda of discussion here, but the impact is discussed. And therefore, you have to, let's say, I think you could see from the numbers more than half of them left. And those who remain, I see 52 is the number. I must thank them because extraordinary patience is needed. That the issues are so wide. That's why I'm saying you choose such a vast theme. Maybe uh, a talented person like uh, 
Desh Pandey could address it, but there is, there is no way that we can discuss them in detail uh, threadbare. I think uh, Utpal was quoting his extensive seminars. It was another lecture, very important issues, but this is not <laughs> the framework in which we could discuss everything under, let's say, uh, agriculture, food security, and rural development. Uh, with that, I think I suggest uh, you just thank the people, thank particularly those who are on uh, still line and the uh, people who have been discussing, and of course, particularly Desh Pandey. Uh, uh, and I think that would be a better way of closing it. Thank you very much. In any way, I am quitting. <laughs> <laughs> So Desh Pandey, it was great listening to you and you have conducted the, uh, this, uh, the webinar very efficiently. Of course, you know, we, we look out for something, you know, which could be a replacement of this webinar where we know we can sit and across the table and discuss things. It was still very great. I mean, it was because of your acumen and of course, listening to Professor Desh Pandey, you know, this is the era of Ram, so I can't say more than this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Sinha. And uh, what we will do that we will collect all the questions from here. From in, in our emails also, we have been getting questions. And also in Facebook and other platforms, we'll compile all and send to all our panelists today. So that uh, later also, Professor Deshpande can chair and all of us can look into all, all, all these many questions. Uh, so uh, thank you all. I, I think most of the things has been summarized and, and come on, uh, commented upon. And I know Sachi sir will be here with me even it is eighth hour. <laughs> that is the training we have been getting in JNU to, to sit, listen and reflect upon uh, this kind of deliberation. Thank you once again, uh, uh, everyone. And uh, now I, I should formally uh, uh, give a vote of thanks, thanking all of you uh, for being here. Uh, so, uh, on behalf of Impact and Policy Research Institute, I uh, thank all of the panelists and all of the viewers and attendees here in Zoom, Facebook Live, and all, all of those who will be watching this on YouTube at your own convenience and reflect upon the issues uh, which our uh, uh, intellectual and our teachers are suggesting us and showing us the direction uh, and reflecting upon what is going on. Uh, let me uh, really thank the speaker for, the, uh, for this uh, very important uh, lecture on agriculture, food security, and rural development amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, insights, concerns, and the way forward for Indian villages uh, by none other than Professor R.S. Deshpande, uh, a, a very honorable uh, intellect of our country, and uh, I would say a superstar in economics, uh, I, I must say. And uh, then let me thank uh, uh, Chair for our discussion today. Uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, D.N. Reddy, thank you, thank you, sir. And I know this is this has been very long, uh, but uh, 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 let me thank you uh, for your uh, uh, very nice uh, 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 coordination and chairing this session. And uh, let me also thank all of our discussants and also those who have not been able to come, uh, Professor um, uh, Madheshwar and Professor uh, Sinha Sachidan Sinha, uh, Professor Utpal Day, uh, Dr. Pradeep Mehta, uh, Professor A. Narayan Murthy was also trying to uh, connect a lot of times. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, Professor G. Sri Devi, thank you uh, very much, ma'am, for uh, on a very short notice coming and highlighting very pertinent points. Uh, Professor uh, Amlendu Jyotshi, thank you again uh, so much for joining here. And uh, Professor Balwan Singh Mehta, I would also like to uh, 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 really thank uh, 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 Professor Nitin Tagde, uh, who has uh, his support and his guidance. and. Uh, 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 his mentorship for uh, uh, planning this event and also with uh, uh, Professor Desh Pandey uh, uh, discussing about this issue and, and helping us to hold this event. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nitin Tagre from Pune. And, uh, and I would like to thank all of you and uh, wish you a very good evening. And uh, I think we should ponder about this issue more and, uh, and uh, learn upon it. And uh, on that note, I would also like to uh, uh, invite all of you to reflect upon any comments and questions which has come uh, in our email. Uh, thank you. Have a, have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. My uh, uh, students from 10, 20, 20 years back students had joined and they had asked where Brother Mandal was there. Uh, there. Nirupam Malhotra was there. 
they, 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 Uday Saiki was there. All of them are abroad, and I feel quite happy that they they also join. Uh, I am happy that Arjun has conducted this very well, and the pleasure was to meet Sachi after a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Sachi. <laughs> great, sir. Great. You know, it was it was it was a delight listening to you, always as ever. You know, so yeah. I wish I could come over to Bangalore and see you. <laughs> It's Thank you. Really lovely to see you uh, on physically seeing you and physically listening to you. That was the <laughs> biggest attraction, I would say. Uh, and this is your love that attracts all all these people who are coming and listening to you. But I'm Lendu, you are in Bangalore. You can walk up to him, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is in Puttur. He is in Puttur. He is in Puttur. Come and see him soon. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. Great, sir. Great. Take care of this Monday. Great, everybody. Professor Mehta, Amlendu, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.